Are we good, Will? Yep. I would like to call to order the Monday, May, or I got something different here. The Thursday, September 29th meeting of uh, the City of Monona City Council. Will the clerk please call the roll? Alder Rademacher? Here. Alder DePula? Here. Alder Holmquist? Here. Alder Moore is excused. Alder Wood? Here. Alder Thomas? Here. Mayor O'Connor? Here. Uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Who's the point? Okay. Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, this will be a quick meeting. Um, there are no minutes to approve. There are no appearances. We have one action item under unfinished business, item 1A, consideration of resolution 22-9-2587, amending the boundary of tax incremental district number four, put forth by the CDA. Is there a motion to approve this? Move to approve. Second. Any questions, concerns? We discussed this at the last meeting, I know. Okay, hearing none, do we need a roll call for this? Do we know? No. Not the clerk? No, no. I don't. Do you? I'm not sure. Well, just one eight, call the roll just, just in case. case. <laughs> Alder to pull up? Aye. Alder Conquest? Aye. Alder Moore, sorry. Alder Wood? Aye. Alder Thomas? Aye. Alder Rodemacher? Aye. Motion passes. There is no new business. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. All right, moving on to the Committee of the Whole. <clears throat> I would like to call to order the Thursday, September 29th meeting of the City Council Committee of the Whole review of 20, 2023 to 2027 Capital Improvements Program and 2023 Capital Borrowing. Will the clerk please call the roll? Alder Wood? Here. Alder Thomas? Aye. Alder Rodemacher? Aye. Alder DePula? Here. Alder Holmquist? Here. Mayor O'Connor? Here. C. Okay, item C. Council review and discussion of 2023 to 2027 Capital Improvements Program and 2023 Capital Borrowing. The first item on our agenda is an overview by Finance Director Mark Hotacker. Yeah. Thanks. Um, before we start the presentation, I kind of want to uh, tell you about what the steps are and how we got to this point right now, um, just newer people. So the way this works is back in, I believe you probably, I think we started back in June, this process. Um, we gave directions out to the department heads, you know, to, to do their capital budgets, to have it go through the committees. Um, once it goes through the committees, um, I put it all together, and each uh, department head meets individually, you know, individually with myself and the mayor that goes over the details of each capital project and after that point um, myself and the mayor sit down and kind of look at this and then figure out what items um, we need to add or subtract in this and you know we had some goals when we were doing this so some of the goals was to keep it the borrowing between 2.5 and 3 as excluding utilities more focus on the general obligations when we do that we wanted to limit the impact on the operating budget. Uh, you do, a lot of times you do a, a project and you realize later on that it has an impact on what you're doing with operating with like say sidewalks or um, more mowing, just different things with facilities. If you build a facility, you gotta pay more insurance on that. Just little things like that, just kind of looking at those and how much that's gonna impact the uh, operating side. Um, so we end up, um, after going through everything, um, we come to two million four hundred ninety-eight thousand nine hundred um, is what the action, what we are for general obligation, excluding utilities. Um, we also focus on the future years because a lot of times you look at two thousand twenty-three, might be the engineering, so we kind of look at twenty-four, see, you know, what how much is that actually going to cost later with the construction, or if there's a big project that's in twenty-four, you know, if you do, and you have engineering, how that all relates and how that's all going to just kind of meshing it all together. So it's a lot of work to kind of figure out um, what we need to borrow for and what are, we're looking for um, as a goal. Um, so everybody knows, I don't know if everybody knows, my state statute, you, you're only allowed to borrow general obligation up to 5% of your equalized value. 
Um, so our current equalized value in the city as of 2001-2022 is 1,735,426,500. By state statute, you're allowed to borrow up to 5% of that, which is uh, 86,771,325. Um, so that's how much you're allowed to use geo notes with that. Um, so as of, two, as of the end of the year, we'll have... 50670000 outstanding. And you're allowed, and when you do the debt limit analysis, you're allowed to take your next year's principal and reduce it by that. Um, so in 2023, your principal payments are going to be six million three hundred five thousand. And you have to, if you have bands outstanding too, you got to add them in because eventually they can be converted to geo notes, and that's $6.5 million. So our net outstanding is Fifty million eight hundred sixty-five thousand. Um, so in the end, we're we have a unused levy type of almost thirty-six million dollars. So we're thirty-six million dollars under our allowable levy. So we have forty-one. So we have forty-one percent. Um, so we're you know fifty-nine percent of debt and then forty-one percent of unused. Um, How is that fifty million broken down? Uh, the city portion is twenty-five million. TIF 4, for everybody who doesn't know, TIF 4 is Monona Drive, um, 3.1. Uh, TIF 5, some people refer to it as Garden Circle, MSP, Heritage, um, that's 7.6. TIF 6 is the uh, uh, storage units that are converted into UW and Meritor Clinic. TIF 7, which is paid off now, um, is Fairway Glen. TIF 8, I call it Trista, the mobile home uh, park. Um, and TIF 9 is the current current area to replace. And then storm, there's some storm we have in there, 3.2. And water is, uh, we do have, because some of the borrowers are so small, we use, for water, we use geo notes on those. So that's the breakdown of the $50 million, 50.6. Um, and then we also have bands out there in revenue bonds. So the general, that's 6.5, that actually is, uh, we have the same Damiani project that, or property. That's that's the note on that. We'll convert that uh, when it comes due. It's a five-year note. Um, we'll convert it into a 20-year note once that reaches that. TIF nine is 11 million dollars is related to TIF increment re revenue bonds. We just did that last year. That stays off your geo capacity or debt limit. And then sewer and water revenue bonds. Uh, the thought process when you look at these revenue bonds is they look at is basically the revenues will pay for the bonds. Their, their enterprise fund, utility funds, and that's what they are. Um, this is just a uh, breakout of the, the debt. 47% is general, 37 is TIF, um, and 16 is uh, utilities when it comes to the general obligation. Here's your future payments. Uh, you're paying over the next couple of years. Again, a lot of that is. TIF payments too. And here's a breakdown of the TIFs. Um, so general funds, you know, right around 3.1. You know, TIFs are 2.8. Water and storm, so on. Um, so, so this is kind of the breakdown. I think it's basically the first sheet in your book. This kind of shows uh, 2023 tw through 2027. Um, the first line. General borrowing, so that's your general obligation stuff, that's your streets, um, the non-utility portion of the streets, your police, fire, public safety, your library and all that. Um, so that's where we get that $2,498,900 um, with that. And then so on, you can see, break down there. Um, so here's an impact on the levy, um, the general obligation portion. Uh, per hundred thousand, so two point five is basically nineteen dollars per hundred thousand. Uh, the tw twenty four excluded the public safety building because that's another discussion we kind of talked about last time. So I just wanted to show what the the non public safety number is is twenty six, and then so on down the line for each different year. A lot of two thousand twenty four to twenty seven are all subject to change because we'll really move those will be moved around when we get to that point. Here's our history of the borrowing from 2016 on. Um, again, this is just general capital projects, not include utilities. 
Um, in debt service payments, the principal and interest are excluded from the levy limit. And there was a lot of talk, um, especially like, for example, St. Damiana project, that the debt we're paying on there, <coughs> that's actually, the principal and interest is excluded from your, your levy limit. Um, so debt service <coughs> is excluded from that. And that actually plays in to little things that you look at and say, why is this on debt? Why are we paying capital for? One of the reasons why it's a levy limit is so strict, we're hard to get it under. And when they converted to this levy limit, a lot of stuff was being paid for by capital at the time, so it's very difficult to put it back on the, uh, the mm -hmm. operating side just because of the levy limit um, restrictions. So there's some major items in this. Um, public safety design, uh, Atwood, engineering for the 2024 street project, which is me in the Tony Watha area, right around that area. Um, street lights replacements, um, convert. Um, Winnicott Park uh, path we're looking at and the community center remodel. Um, uh, major changes uh, added or moved or removed. I, did, I was going to put a, a bunch of stuff on here, but if you actually go to page three, um, there's all the details of that. Some of that stuff is just changing the funding sources, um, but some of the stuff is being moved. And, and that's probably the biggest thing, you know, we went through and we have reasons for that. I mean, you know, it's a thought process and, you know, some people think, well, you're just picking on public works, you know, parks or something. But there's a lot of thought, press, thought process put into that um, and things like that. So it's not we just like handpicked an, uh, an item and moved it, you know, right or wrong. You know, the goal is the 2.5 and the public safety building. So. You know, the big picture is if we're going to do a public safety building that 46 to 48 million dollars, you know, we're trying to keep the capital down, borrowing down. Um, maybe if we didn't have those per that big number coming up, might have been different looking at the projects, but we all know that's out there. So that was also one of the things we looked at. And then items to think about for the future, the public safety building, um, some HVAC issues here at the library. So it's a lot of roof issues. Um, you put the solar projects on there too, project. You know, if you're replacing these roof, they have solar on there right now, like the library, public works building, the city hall, that'll be something. We, we do replace the roof, we gotta figure out what we're doing with the solar. So things like that are on there, we're looking in the future. Um, so Tony Wather Road, which is the, like I said, engineering this year for next year. Um, um, you know, some, Projects, you know, um, <clears throat> five to 15 years, the community center, a new pool, uh, the North Winnicott Park improvements. Um, so some of the things we're thinking about. And there's potential borrowings too, and developers agreements. So right now we're within what, four, five different, you know, I think four maybe developers coming in, you know, <clears throat> asking for TIF, you know, those TIF projects. and construction projects that we can do with the TIF projects and then just future projects in emergency if we ever need money for emergency. Um, utility rates, um, since we're not doing a lot of utility borrowing this year, there was no effect um, to the utilities. Um, just, there was items in there for the public works, there were some larger items. We did move some of that stuff uh, back a year because the thought process and just more working with that our financial advisors. Bondholders like to see bigger borrowings when it comes to revenue bonds. So some of the numbers we had were kind of small. So they like, you know, seeing the bigger numbers like say half million or two million or one point five to two million dollars. And some of these were I mean if we would have left them in there, they would have been small dollars, we'd have the GO note. So maybe they're looking at we move some of the utility projects just for better packages. I'm getting probably better rates um, with the moving into revenue bonds and waiting a year. So that's all I have. I don't know if you have questions. Questions, anyone? Mm -hmm. Doug? Mark, on uh, page three, the summary of the items that were cut. Yeah. Um, it looks to me like there's like the bridge and street maintenance repair resurfacing is it's on there twice and it, yeah, I'm so sure what what's going on there. So basically, we did take um, so we didn't move the three hundred fifty three was the original. We took a hundred thousand out just based on prior years what we already spent on that, and then we do seven, then we move seventy thousand to TIF because it's going to be part of the uh, 
Monona Gardens areas, that whole area they're kind of redoing, I think we have that portion as ours, so we are putting that portion into TIP. So that part is just changing the funding source. For that. Okay, but there's only one project, and the real, the real number is 183, right? Yeah, is it only, is it only one? Yeah, yeah 183 is the general the TIF, form. Right. It's the general portion yeah. of it. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's all. Brian? And Mark, I just want to make sure that I understand correctly. So earlier when you were talking about the percentage um, that you have for, available for debt, the 5%, and yeah. if I followed your math correctly, it looks like what we have available is roughly the $36 million? Uh, yeah, let me just double check here. I believe that's what it is. It's, yeah, it's that yeah. last, that $35 million, $906. Yeah. So how do you... Like, am I thinking this right? Like, if a public safety building is slated to be more than that, so that, how that is that even a, possible? Yeah, so we're looking at a different type of loan for that that would not be general obligation, so it would not be affected by the state debt limit. We're looking at uh, USG loans or state trust fund loans, so okay. they, they don't impact that number. And does the debt service on those other types of loans impact for the future regarding <coughs> the other debt? Does the interest in payments on those loans impact future debt availability? Uh, not for general obligation. Okay. And this is just as of next year, right? It, yeah. Well, we wouldn't have borrowed for the public safety building. Right, but I think <coughs> if we, like, I think Brian's correct. If we, if we won general obligation, we would not have enough yeah. to cover that. So that was always been the thought process. We were not going to use that. Okay. Well, that... But, well, wouldn't that number increase going forward but when the value, uh, equalized value goes up? Yeah, each year that goes up. <clears throat> so, because um, I think last year was 1 .5, 1 billion, 1 1.5 billion last year. So it went up like about over 200, 200 billion. <laughs> so, so that number increases every year. Okay. Anyone else? Questions for Mark? Okay, well then we will move on to our first department presentation, which is community media. Will. And that is on page 121. Well, can I speak before we'll talk? Sure. I don't have, actually, I, I read the microphone all over. <clears throat> so this one, um, we talked a lot about this one. <laughs> and I forgot to mention that. This used to be paid all by franchise fees. So Will's did, stuff. Yeah, for cable, media. Um, just based on his operating budget and some of the stuff involved, we, we backed. And now a portion of it's covered by um, general obligation. Um, so I don't know what yeah. About. So, <clears throat> excuse me. The first... Uh, Item. I'll just start with the items, and I think this is kind of where uh, it started, was where we save all the videos and everything that we create and, and, and you all create through council meetings, plan commission meetings, uh, all the Zoom meetings we're now having and have had. We need a place to store those, and that's through our server, our video server. Uh, and that's now eight years old. <coughs> and basically, as those things happen, there's no longer able to be updated it's software updates right it's just kind of obsolete <clears throat> and it still works but my concern is that it's where we sort of save everything it's our seven-year obligation to hold these legally and if we wait too long and something does happen to it we we lose not only meetings but we also lose a lot of the archival videos for Monona so we're talking about the building of Winnicott Park, that video, the 75th anniversary video. Uh, so it's, it's an expensive piece of, of gear, as it says, 24,000. Um, and it's more than, right, more than what I usually spend on equipment. It's like almost double of what I usually spend on equipment. But now that we have a lot of these meetings being saved and everything else, we need to be careful to, again, make sure we're fulfilling our ob legal obligation and also not losing some of those archives. So that's what that's kind of where the uh, conversation started with general obligation and things. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And, and then the other uh, few items are, are straightforward. A, a new video production computer. Uh, those, of course, video editing, audio editing, graphics, animation. And some new streaming hub updates for 4500. That's right. That's just what we do all the time. We're streaming things all the time right now, and so we just like a like a plow. We need to keep updating our our gear and uh, get those in those five year, eight year rotations. And the last item is uh, just some audio updates in the radio station so that we can uh, record our on air broadcast. Um, just again, just for a a check on, on what we're doing to make sure we have a, a record outside of just on paper. We've had um, last year some open records requests for what we play on WBMO, and this might help us a little bit in that capacity as well. Mark, <clears throat> well, if we go back to the first one, seven thousand of that. Just uh, Thank you. Like yep. So I did. I did talk to the school district, and they uh, they will be uh, contributing seven thousand to that um, to that amount. So um, I think it was thirty thousand. We're getting it down, and then they're contributing seven, and that's where we get we get down here. Um, I'm confident I may be able to even get this twenty four even lower once we start talking about implementation and purchasing because uh, they do offer municipal rates. Uh, we just haven't got that far with them. Well, I, just to um, clarify something for everyone about the videos of meetings, those are stored on YouTube, but legally we have to store them on the server as well, right. correct? We can't just yeah. rely on YouTube to be That's a good storage. point, right. So they're on YouTube, <clears throat> but then legally that doesn't count as us holding a physical retention of the file. Um, in, our, in our discussions with the city attorney, that doesn't count. Uh, we need to have a physical, prem, you know, it has to be on our premises, if you will. Patrick? Uh, never mind, you just answered my question about the okay. physical presence. Yeah. Anyone else have any questions for Will? I think we're good. Thank you. Okay. Next up is IT. That's Leah, and that's be page 25. <clears throat> good evening, everybody. The IT budget this year is um, a little more than you're used to seeing from me lately in the <coughs> IT budget, and there's pretty much one reason for that, and that's cameras. <laughs> um, we have in the past purchased cameras. Um, each department has sort of purchased cameras as needed for their own department with obviously the police department um, having the most cameras um, that they needed to purchase. But then as we did things like build new park shelters um, and expand park services, we started putting cameras into places like that. So we have cameras at the riverfront um, skating rink. We have cameras at Fireman's Park Shelter. We have cameras at Schluter Beach now. Um, so we are now up to more than 75 cameras um, in different places throughout the city, mostly our city buildings and in parks. Um, we have decided because we have so many cameras now that we are going to um, encompass them all into the IT budget, take them out of individual budgets, and um, have the same type of annual replacement schedule for cameras that we use for computers um, so that we don't have years like this year where we have huge amounts of camera replacements that need to be done all at once. So this budget um, has $77,400 um, of spending for cameras. A big chunk of that is actually for this building in the library. Um, we have 17 cameras, I believe, um, 28 total cameras in this building. Right now, only 17 of them are working. So in this budget, we'd like to replace half of the total cameras and then um, finish that off to replace half next year. <clears throat> um, $20,000 of this budget, actually probably the smallest part of this budget is for computer replacements. We have a, a good program in our replacement schedule going right now so that we're not doing big amounts of replacements every year. 
Um, the other big ticket item in this budget, we need to replace our police arbitrator server next year. Um, that's an expensive video server that costs $25,000, but that stores all of the um, squad car footage and all of the police body cam footage. So, um, and then um, a couple other projects, the senior center, um, we'd like to purchase a display and sound system with a wireless mic for the senior center. Um, I think Diane's capital spending is usually the lowest out of any city department. So even though it seems like a big expense, it's I think well worth it for her um, department. Um, that's kind of it in a nutshell, unless you have any other specific questions about things. Did you want to talk about the locks here at the, at the library? Oh, another, um, I guess, project that we'd like to do here at the library for $5,000 is to add a panic button with door locks in this building, which we don't currently have. Um, in case we have a kiddo that wanders out and we need to lock down the building um, or something worse happens, um, it's really for safety, something we need to do here. Anyone have questions for Leah? Um, out of those 75 ish cameras that we have, do those all go to the dispatch or just some of them or some of them just for review later? Yeah, most of them I think are for review later. So um, we have um, um, camera video recorders. And so they record, and then once the video recorder is full, they record over the footage. So. Okay. Anyone else? Well, Brian? Might as well ask now. Um, in the past, we talked about if they were all accessible by web interface. And of the 75, my guess is not all of these are in that setup, but we would be moving in that direction. Yeah, I think um, all of the cameras currently here at the library that work are actually analog cameras, so those would all be replaced by digital. All right. So, yeah. yeah. Patrick. I guess <clears throat> further question about that. Is that something that we're uh, like storing in the cloud like with a service that already exists or do we uh, invest in the equipment to s store all that information here? Well, I think that we stream the footage. There are some cameras that are streamed live in dispatch and I think that footage is stored for a period of time and then it's written over. Mm. Um, and then like the cameras in the parks and stuff, we can't see those live, so that's just recorded and then recorded over when those recorders get full. Gotcha. Um, I think those recorders are about $5,000 a piece. So I wonder, and I guess just thought, I wonder if we save money by going with a solution that already exists that that stuff is stored in the cloud and reviewed instead of spending the $5,000 on the recorders, but there has to be some sort of communications system, whether yeah. it's cellular or whatever, to do that. Yeah. And I wonder if that offsets the five thousand dollars for every recorder i can certainly talk to our it consultants about about the benefits pros and cons of doing that okay just a thought yep thank you mm -hmm. Teresa. <clears throat> just to um, build on what you just said leah um how is our when will our current it consultants be um that, that relationship that we have is that just a contract that's reviewed periodically and and for how long have we been with them? Oh gosh, um, I think we have been with them now um, since probably for a decade, since okay. 2012, I want to say. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a just a, a renewing contract every okay. year. Yeah. So it's part of the operating budget. Yeah. Got it. Um, as far as what's in front of me now. Um, what is the life cycle that I'm... That, how many years go by before I'm assuming this, these consultants are recommending some of these changes, like mm -hmm. desktops, perhaps because they have a SOP, you know, standard operating procedure of like every four years you get new hardware. Is what what is the turnover on that? On the on the replacement schedule? Yeah. Um, so it depends on the user. So we have every city computer user um, categorized per how they use the computer, and we have you know, high users and then, you know, down to low users. So it depends. Um, for super users, we're probably replacing computers every four to five years, mm -hmm. but then we're often redeploying those computers to lower end users. 
I think right now we have about, I think my calculations are we have a total of probably 106 computers in the city, which mm -hmm. includes desktops, um, laptops, and tablets. Okay. Any other questions? I'm happy to show you that schedule too if you'd like to see yeah. it, Teresa. And I'm, <coughs> and I'm just seeing hardware here. Are there rolled in with this? Are there also like licenses that we pay for? And yep, that's a good question. Um, so, sort of obviously, <laughs> the way that the IT world is going Correct. is software as a service yep. and license fees as opposed to outright software purchases. Right. Um, and that is something that we're going to have to discuss in the operating budget. Um, okay. Most. I mean, our email we all do with um, renewing license fees now. Right. Um, our um, firewalls, our virus protection. Um, we buy Photoshop and Illustrator licenses on annual renewals now. So um, we're definitely moving in the direction of our IT is going to become much more operating budget intensive. Well, even Microsoft um, Office itself. Yeah. I mean, it's yes, a bit and, of a and Microsoft <laughs> Office is the yeah. big thing that yeah. we're. I'm um, going to have to look at for 2024. So, And then one last thing. Can you speak a bit more to the I am responding uh, service? You know, I think maybe Chief McMullen okay. might be able to describe that better than I can. That sounds if great. Willing. Okay. Thank you. Who do you want to speak to? Chief I McMullen? I'm happy, oh. that, that's our alerting system. That our volunteers have it on their phone, but it's also an alert system. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Next up is library. Ryan, page 93. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I have two projects for this year. Um, one for the fire alarm system. Our current fire alarm system is uh, out of date, more or less has sunsetted. I've been informed that for them to do the last update on it, they had to dig up, I believe it was a gateway laptop, which they don't make anymore. So um, felt that it was a good time to replace it. And luckily, the quote is not as high as it could be because there are components of the current system that they can leave and the one, the stuff that needs to be updated. The, the main terminal, which is in our back, um, formerly known as sorter room, and then there's a smaller terminal that's um, in the vestibule on the lower level. They'll be replacing those, and that's the that's the biggest cost, but the biggest need to update, um, and that will help um, keep keep our fire alarm system viable, which I find to be a priority. The second project is a library sign, so it'd be replacing the library sign on the lower level as you enter the parking lot. I'm not sure if any of you have seen it. Um, it's been there, I believe, for quite a while, um, showing a lot of wear. I also have plans to replace the sign at the top of the hill. I'm currently uh, talking with our uh, with, with Doug Plowman, and then also I will have to present to the plan commission. I do have plans to see if it's possible to get an electronic sign up there, but I understand that there are some um, conversations that would need to be had regarding our um, city ordinance when it comes to electronic signs, since the library is technically in a res zoned residential. So. That's neither here nor there. This this project here is for the the lower level sign, which I'm currently working on getting that replaced. Questions? questions? Or I guess I should let you address your. Yeah, those are both of your items. Does anybody have any questions for Ryan? I do. Doug. Um, the sign on, up on the hill is missing some lettering. Is that something that could be? replaced if the sign's not being replaced itself? Yes, we do have pl plans to make it so that the Gregory sign can be properly attributed to the yeah. family that donated the money. Great. Anyone else? Teresa? Can you speak to the sign? Also a question about the sign. <coughs> there was a sign that was removed 
by the mayor on page three and how is that different we just changed the funding he had wanted seventy five thousand for the two signs and sounds good i know that typically at least in the past we paid about five thousand five or six thousand for the signs like the one down at the end of the driveway so yeah um, and so we'll see what i <clears throat> admittedly have had a very difficult time getting called backs for quotes the original sign company that we've been using at least the library has and also parks and rec um is no longer there yeah. and so i'm working to get a uh, better accurate number but this one is for the based on the quote that i received prior to the pandemic this is the closest one which mm -hmm. does seem relatively high based on what the, like, as the mayor said prior was like five thousand um, dollars but this project is for that and then i'll we'll probably have to look down the road especially if i'm able to do an electronic sign i i, I would only assume that would be more expensive sure and that's why we cut it we didn't know what the exact we didn't have a good estimate what yeah. that was, and so we thought be more research on that one. So that's why that was moved down. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next is Diane, Senior Center, page one ten. So the proposal that I have for next year is to um, update the family or gender neutral restroom that we have in the lower level of the senior center. All other bathrooms in the community center have been updated. Um, and this is a restroom that's right off of our programming space. Um, so it hasn't been updated. Uh, Teresa came in and visited a bit ago and um, forever, I've been here 20 plus years, we've had a sign on saying, please hold the button down for 15 seconds because it doesn't properly flush. And we've had it repaired many, many times. It's functional, but just like Will was saying, you know, it's probably just a matter of time before this is a, not something that we're taking care of in advance, but something that we have to take mm -hmm. care of. So, um, you know, of course, once you replace the toilet, then there's the tile floor and it's very dated. Um, in the description here, it talks about um, if we do the restroom, we of course have to do the tile floor. There's a built-in garbage receptacle that's like built into the wall, which I'm sure the guys who empty the trash love that because you gotta <laughs> finagle the everything back in. So just making it more of a normal restroom, right? Just a garbage can. The sink is just like an installed sink. There's nowhere to put a bag or you know, set a cane down for some of the seniors. So I would like to have a tiny bit of a countertop space so that they can um, use the restroom and set something down. So pretty basic, not looking for anything fancy, just updating that restroom. Um, so when Jake comes in, we're gonna talk about the whole community center uh, renovation, which is a much bigger project. And I think the plan would be, we would roll this into that. Um, mm -hmm. Years ago, when Jake originally wanted to do a community center uh, renovation, it was a much bigger dollar amount that it was an ask for, and that was kind of cut in half. So as we were doing the, um, the planning for it, this bathroom was not really considered. So I thought, I thought it was important, let's put it in there, because I do think it needs to be a priority. Everything else will be kind of updated, and this restroom is just a matter of time. So, Any questions? Yeah. <coughs> Teresa? Um, Diane, I know that was so nice to talk with you about that earlier. And I just, could you just refresh my memory? So you're, you're thinking new floor, toilet, sink with some area, storage underneath it, maybe yeah. fixtures, a grab bar. Is correct. there anything yes. else I'm mixing? What was that? A, a grab bar or something. Like grab bar is correct. Yeah. Yes, it is no longer really up to code, so we really need yeah. the grab bars. And is there anything special about, you know, the sink or the seat that, because of the uh, perhaps special needs of the folks who will be going in and out of that room? It, they using? would all be up to ADA uh, standards, which would be yeah, any just, update that we would do now. So, yeah, yeah so, so I think nothing, that would, but I don't think yeah. anything. Nothing out of the ordinary. Extraordinary, okay. yeah. correct. Okay, yep. great, thanks. And while I'm up here, if anybody has questions about the community center renovation, because a lot of that does focus on the lower level, I'd be happy to answer questions about the current space or the yeah, redesign. It's basically all senior center, so I you know, kind of take a look at that. Yeah. Because so are you going to be here when Jake presents? I can if you, yeah, I can stay. Or if you want to take a look at it now, I'd prefer if you kind of. Whatever you prefer. 
Yeah, we just, I guess we had Brian and Jerry in between. Yeah. <clears throat> we could take a quick look at it and then talk, and, it, and you'll be back on Monday. Um, yeah. It'll be for first read, so if we have questions, you can ask them too. Okay. <clears throat> so nothing but right now on the It's on page 97. You want to talk about it right now? Yeah, well, I, I just had one question in mm -hmm. particular. Is, does this include the um, doing something with the stairway? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. a new, new stairway? Yep. Okay. Yeah, new stairway, and then um, the opening of that will allow us to move reception to not in the middle of our programming space. So that's pretty exciting. And I know, Doug, one of your concerns was the um, – Right now we're doing the foot care clinic in the computer room. <laughs> so right. designing that right. wellness room yeah. in a very appropriate space that has a sink and not carpet, easily cleaned, so much better for our senior volunteers to manage a foot clinic in that room. And this starts on page 97 if anybody has. Um, and Diane, are you moving into a new room for your office, or we're just giving it some nicer finishes? I can't remember. Um, it would it would move, um, but right now it backs to a janitor's closet. That's right. my I think my office is seventy five square feet, <laughs> so um, it would give me that little extra space. And I think they might be able to put heat in that office as well if we. <laughs> and what a treat to heat your office. You know? <laughs> I don't ask much. It's a little bit easier. It's really sad. I, <laughs> you're such a spendthrift. Yeah. I know, right? I know. It's been my routine. <laughs> so. so, yeah, we did cut some from the proposed community center remodel, but I think we kept everything in the senior center. Yep. Kept all the senior yeah. stuff and then <coughs> one other thing for, yeah. One yeah. Or two of the for Jake. So that's why it, mainly it's going to be your stuff. So if you have questions on that, I would right. pre probably prefer to ask Diane now. Yeah. You kind of want to explain what's going on downstairs. It, and if you know, for those of you who weren't as part of discussions in years past, the, the stairwell is really a safety issue. If if you haven't walked <laughs> up or down that stairwell, um, I'm glad we don't use it a lot right now because we have all the seniors enter at the lower level. But it really is. Um, uh, it doesn't stay stable. It moves when you yeah. walk on it. So, <coughs> and like prior to the bridge. pandemic, yeah, we've had people fall, it and it's yeah. it's time. We need to do something with that. <coughs> Anyone have any questions for Diane? If I have questions about the community center in general, is that something to save for Jake? Is it more? If you have something about the senior part of it, yeah. you could ask now. I do. And in general, then you might as well save it for I'll Jake. Wait. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Great. Diane. Thanks. And the staff will be at both of our next two council meetings if we have questions, okay. too, before we finally take a vote. <clears throat> um, next is fire protection EMS, Jerry, and that's on page... 41 and 46. Well, good evening. Um, I'm just going to start off by saying thank you. I, I do appreciate the support from the Capital Project. Then. Um, I know none of it is cheap, especially on the fire and EMS stuff, so I do appreciate it. Um, I'll start with the fire protection side um, with the four projects uh, that we have listed. Uh, the brush truck project um, was put in uh, for this year to replace our 2009 um, not quite a brush truck. Uh, it was a truck that was put in service. It was the previous chief's vehicle because we had nothing else to haul the, the, the pump sled that we got from Walmart. Um, I looked up some stats. Just last year we ran 26 brush fire calls, which would be off the road fire calls that, that we would utilize that vehicle for and five vehicle fires in underground parking garages, which is what that's utilized for secondarily, is because it can get places where our engine can't get to. <clears throat> um, that project, uh, 70000 the chassis has been ordered by the, the council's resolution earlier this year. They're honoring the current state bid price um, for 2021, which I'm very glad for because the price has gone up by almost $20,000. So we're getting it for the original bid price um, because we bid early. The truck itself will start being built uh, the end of October. We delivered sometime in mid March. I don't have a don't have a VIN number yet, so I don't actually don't have a delivery date. But it'll be sometime in the the first quarter of next year. The remainder of that's the thirty two thousand dollars to outfit the truck. We are going to reuse the skid unit from the truck we currently have. <coughs> it is in good shape. <coughs> Excuse me, and 
New skid units run about $35,000. Um, so we're going to reuse this one uh, so there's no additional cost to the city. The, that $32,000 for outfitting, we're going to apply for a DNR reimbursement grant. Anything we put on that truck to make it a brush truck, any of the equipment, the lighting, the radios, um, the winch, anything that we use to outfit that as a brush truck, we can write for a 50% reimbursement grant through DNR. Uh, we have all the paperwork in place. We have the MOU signed. It's just a matter of submitting it. Um, it is a reimbursement grant, so we purchase and then we submit for reimbursement. Uh, that opens up in July of next year and is awarded by August 1st. Any the place? other three are mm -hmm. annual replacement items. Um, the <coughs> radio replacement schedule I added $1,000 to based on this year's cost of radios. Um, we went slightly above what our budget was because the cost has increased. Um, but in return for that, we got five radios instead of four. So we got an extra radio out of last year than, uh, that we weren't uh, thinking we were going to get. The durable equipment, $5,000. <coughs> Excuse me, I've been talking all afternoon trying to get the plan <laughs> set up. So um, just to give you an idea of what gets purchased with this durable equipment light item, the fire that we had earlier this year up, up on Midmore, uh, we lost a, a, a nozzle got lost because of all the different departments. Um, never got reclaimed from any of the other departments. That nozzle alone is $1,200 just for that. If I have a length of five inch hose go, which is their 100 foot lengths, a current cost right now is $1,100 a roll for a 100 foot piece of hose. Just plain old five inch rubber hose. So that's what that line item's for. We had several volunteers start this year, so part of that was used to purchase new pagers as well. So we got five new pagers out of that that weren't budgeted because we weren't aware we were going to get that many volunteers. So for an idea of where that money goes on an annual basis, it's for unexpected large dollar expenses that we don't have budgeted. <coughs> and the PPE replacement, I'm happy to report I was able to cut $10,000 off of that. Um, we've done a lot of catch up. So currently next year we have four sets that are due for replacement. I budgeted for five in case we have somebody else start. We had a young lady start this year that we literally had no gear for because she was so small. So we had to buy a new set of gear for her. Um, if we get somebody of that stature again, I need to have the ability to buy a set of gear for them. Um, so that's the, the fire side of things. Um, Does anybody have any question questions. about fire side? How did you cut $10,000 off the cost? Um, normally I budget for 10 sets a year, oh, okay. uh, just based on our numbers. Got it. Um, we've been very aggressive trying to catch up over the last couple of years, and we were able to do that. Um, so like I say this year we've got four sets that are coming up for, that are going to be out of date. Um, <coughs> so, and I will say thank you to the council for amending my capital budget this year because that was part of it. We had a, we had a bunch of new people start this year. That's so. great. Anyone else? Okay, you want to do the other part? The EMS yeah, the second one on the EMS side. Um, page 46. <coughs> I've got two, two things with, with the, the chassis here, and I will apologize because I, I may have mislabeled this as Medic 62. Mm -hmm. um, it, this is the new ambulance that's coming in 2024 um, that the council approved to, to order. Um, first of all, the, the Dollar amount on that, that 46700 is accurate, but that does need to be moved. That We do have a grant awarded to pay for that in full. So that will should come off of the GO debt line and be under grant. Um, Public Safety Commission approved the grant last night. Well, it was last night, right? Yes, it was last night. Um, and uh, it'll be in front of the council on the 3rd for final approval, but uh, we've submitted the budget for that. They gave us a limited award, but we utilized a lion's share of that to pay for the chassis. This was an unexpected expense in 23, um, so we wanted to make sure that was taken taken off the, the list. Um, I would like to, to speak about the load system, um, and that, that's why I say I apologize if I, if I mislabeled this. This is for the new ambulance. Um, ordering it in 23 will save us about $15,000. That's a 20% increase every single year. Um, so the idea being we we're going to order at the end of this year to take care, advantage of 22's prices to, to pay for it in 23. You're talking about the load system. Yes, the load system. Um, 
And then speaking as the, the staffing for two ambulances, I can tell you this month alone we have 120 hours of double staffing in the ambulances. Uh, even going forward, regardless of how it ends up with bargaining, we're going to be staffing an LTE three days a week, daytime hours, specifically to put a second ambulance in service. So whether it's staffed with me or with a, a full-time member, um, we've got to get a second ambulance in service. So we will have staffing for two ambulances next year. Um, we've budgeted out of my LTE budget at least 120 hours a month just for second ambulance staffing. So I would request that that get put back in just from a money saving standpoint. Um, and also if it's ordered and purchased and delivered early next year, we'll put it in our current ambulance. And then when the new one gets delivered, we'll move it into the new ambulance. You have one in your current ambulance, right? We have a power top but no load in the backup ambulance. So that's that's the concern I have. I have a power load system and cot in the in the frontline ambulance. But as we staff the second ambulance, now I'm asking people who are not necessarily lifting the cot all the time like they used to, to go from a power load system to a cot with no power load where they have to lift again. Um, so I would again I would I would like to order, get it here as quick as we can, get it installed in our current second ambulance, and then when the new ambulance is delivered in twenty four, we'll move it to the new ambulance. But that gives both of our ambulances a lift system that the, the second one currently doesn't have. And a bit selfishly, I run a lot of hours on that second ambulance and I would really like to have a load system for my back. <laughs> yeah. So that that would be my request. Anyone? I do have a question. Um, surprise, surprise. Um, uh, Chief on page 46. So uh, did I understand correctly that the figure I'm seeing here, 46,700, is actually coming off because of the grant that was awarded? Yeah, so yes. we'll move it to the other. The entire amount is coming off. Yeah. Of just the chassis. It's not the whole ambulance. Yeah, not the next year. So That's no. just the base of the ambulance. That's 46. We're paying the rest yeah. of it next so 46, year. So 46,700 is great. Right. Yeah, okay. so we yeah, got the numbers right. after yeah. just recently. So yeah. it was after kind nice of all was done. Yeah. That's wonderful. Anyone else? Do you have any other questions? Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate you make it easy on me tonight. So. Uh, next, law enforcement and emergency communications. Uh, law enforcement is 30 and emergency communications is 48. Hello, everyone. Um, law enforcement, we have uh, nine projects proposed. Uh, as uh, approved by our wonderful Public Safety Committee uh, for recommendation. Um, starting with item number one in the project, uh, we replace our squad cars typically uh, every five to eight years. The patrol squads, which get used obviously much more frequently, get replaced uh, sooner than, uh, say, our assistant chief squad or our detective squad. Um, we are actually due to replace two squads this year. Um, uh, the finance manager uh, and acting administrator uh, made it clear that uh, we're in a crunch uh, and asked uh, all of us to look at items that we potentially can hold off for future years. Uh, I am that sacrificial lamb of the police department um, and my squad will not be replaced. Um, it will have to eventually, but uh, I am nursing that until it needs to be. Um, so this vehicle is replacing a patrol vehicle that is at, that it's, uh, at its uh, end of service uh, due to the miles on it, the wear and tear, etc. cetera. Uh, this will be a change for this police department, and I discussed this at length at, at public safety, but we're transitioning uh, a couple of our vehicles to larger vehicles. Reason being is that uh, I, I'm, not, I'm sure many of you have seen some of our staff uh, on hand. They are um, taller and bigger, uh, some smaller, uh, all capable, um, but our uh, bigger statured uh, officers who can probably compete in the world's strongest men and women competition, um, they're having issues getting into the newer model SUVs based on the redesign. The redesign only allows you to push the seat back so far and Ford did away with the, um, um, the pedals that adjust. Uh, they, they used to have that option in the vehicles. So I, I, I did it intentionally. I put a picture of one of our, our officers 
Because actually I saw him getting in a, a car and I asked how comfortable he was and he replied, absolutely not at all. Um, heaven forbid our officers get into a crash. Uh, this is, this is going to cause significant injury uh, for our officer based on all the equipment in there and how uh, he's positioned. And he's not the only one. There are several uh, of them that are similar size as, as he. The Ford F-150s, after doing some exploring, is what can we do uh, as an alternative to an SUV that can be an accommodation for some of our officers? The Ford F-150 came on top. Uh, it's Ford. It's what we know. Um, the equipment that they make for the police vehicles uh, will fit in it. Uh, it's been utilized in a variety of agencies in Wisconsin, so it's winter-proven, so to speak. Uh, it is all-wheel drive, and it comes with the EcoBoost engine. Uh, that we currently use in a lot of our squad cars. Uh, there is a uh, all-electric version of that that just came out. Uh, I would prefer, however, not to, to be the, the guinea pig on that experiment. Um, we are currently having uh, significant challenges uh, to the hybrid vehicles that we have, uh, Ford Explorers, not only in the delay in receiving them once we order them. Uh, for example, we ordered one earlier this year. We have yet to see it. Uh, or have a time frame as to when we're going to get it, um, but also some mechanical uh, issues that we're having uh, with them. Uh, it's a relatively new uh, platform for Ford, uh, and they're making them in mass, um, and with the delays that occurred uh, from the chip shortage and supply shortage, um, I think we're, we're, they're still working out a lot of the kinks. Uh, our, our hybrid vehicles must go to our uh, local dealership for service Mind you, most of these are brand new vehicles within the last five years. Um, once a month, uh, sometimes twice, uh, to get service. And we're talking about significant issues, whereas you uh, fully depress the pedal because you have to go in emergency mode and the car goes nowhere. Um, sometimes those are quick fixes like software updates. Sometimes it takes a long, longer time for, uh, for the dealership to figure out what the issue is. Um, we've been lucky so far that we've not had disastrous problems like some of our, our other agencies in the area have had. Uh, and this is not a knock on Ford. This happens with every new vehicle that's out there. Um, but some vehicles have uh, completely um, been ruined, in essence, by uh, either the install or uh, the technology uh, it doesn't keep up with the equipment that's in the vehicle. And it causes some issues with the, the hybrid uh, powertrain. So uh, we're transitioning to try a uh, Ford uh, F-150, that'll also give us the capability not only for size, interior, but uh, we collect a lot of bicycles. Uh, our, our residents call in a lot of lost bicycles or wanting to give away bicycles or uh, bicycles that are stolen and recovered. Um, and right now, those don't fit in the back of our SUVs. Um, and it is not safe to put a bike trailer on the back of the, the SUVs based on how much we do traffic stops at night. And that blocks a lot of the lights and the reflective material that's on the back of the squad. So the F-150 has proven to be that, that vehicle. So we're asking for one car uh, this year. OK, moving right along. Um, I, have, I have a question. Yes. For you. So it is a, it's a pickup truck. Yes. Right? OK. So <laughs> yes. That's new. So does other departments in the area have used these, have them in service? Or? Some prairie does. Yes, uh, they do. Um, sure. What we're seeing is that actually uh, agencies that need the larger <laughs> vehicles, other than some prairie who utilize uh, the F-150, they actually go to Expeditions, uh, which are you know the SUV version of the F-150. Um, and the fuel mileage ratings, I, 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 I wasn't happy at all in seeing the fuel uh, consumption ratings on those. Um, so we've opted with the F-150. That actually does better than the Chevy Silverado and some of the other vehicles out there. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Brian? Total project cost on the breakdown sheet is showing 70,000, but in our spreadsheet it's showing 110. That's it? Is that for outfitting it? Um, is the additional for outfitting the vehicle? Uh, no, it should reflect. Where's the same mm -hmm. antenna? Okay. For that project, it should reflect the 70. That's the wrong year. I think you're, that's 26 you're looking at. So, so in the future wrong. years, we will need to replace more than one vehicle. So you're probably looking at 24, maybe? Okay. No, I'm okay. looking at 26. Oh, 26. Okay. Because I didn't turn the page. <laughs> okay. 
Um, on the project two, some of the because we're getting a brand new vehicle, um, we often get there's some items that we we can replace from the outgoing vehicle uh, and reuse, I should say, and repurpose uh, into the, the new vehicle. Uh, so we're not going to be able to have that advantage with transitioning to an F-150, but some of the things we'll be able to transition. Um, but we will need new equipment, starting with a, a new uh, laptop and modem. Uh, as you can imagine, that gets a lot of use too. Uh, pulling the screen up and down, typing on it daily, uh, and it being roughly five years old uh, of constant usage. Uh, so both a modem and a tough book <coughs> is what we're asking for for that new uh, F-150. Questions on that? Project three is the uh, radio systems that go uh, in the vehicles. We need uh, two per vehicle. The reason we're getting, uh, I'm asking for a third, um, is because we currently don't have anything on the shelf in the event we have a radio that goes down. Uh, if the radio goes down, uh, we don't have any uh, costs to sort of order that. They're, they're uh, rather pricey uh, pieces of equipment. But we also utilize that to swap out. Um, I will take my radio out of my car and put it in the, a patrol car, for example. Uh, I can get away with not having one of the two radios. Um, patrol relies on these heavily. The reason we have two radios is one communicates through the uh, 800 megahertz system, which uh, several uh, police agencies are on, the, the Madison Police Department, uh, some other agencies, and then we have the VHF radios, which half of the other county is on, and we communicate with all agencies. And you would think in a post-9-11 world, we'd be on the same sort of bandwidth. Uh, that's not quite happened yet. Okay. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, our electronic control devices, commonly referred to as TAVER because that's who the manufacturer is. Uh, we are in a replacement cycle, which we're act actually lagging behind um, due to shifting priorities and, and capital and, and, and previous capital project years. Um, we, we try to replace those every two years. Um, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Uh, we try to, uh, yes, our replacement cycle is every two years for what we currently have in, in stock. Um, the warranty on them is five years, so we get typically about five years on a good taser. Uh, but as you can imagine, uh, those also get a lot of wear and tear, not by using them in the field, but the, the manufacturer requires a spark test to verify that it's actually working. And so those are, things are getting lit up a couple times a day uh, before they, they go out. Uh, and as any software company or proprietary uh, organization does, uh, they make it so that um, you have to purchase a new one every so often or else the software is out, outdated. Um, and that's exactly what Taser does. It's a good product. Uh, it's, uh, darn near has a monopoly uh, in the, for uh, electronic control devices, uh, particularly for law enforcement, um, but it's a, it's a trusty and dependable product. And, um, Again, uh, ECDs are a less lethal option for the officers. Questions on that? Body-worn cameras, which I'm wearing today. I have one of the oldest cameras um, uh, that the department has. Um, the, again, issue of wear and tear, being out in all the elements, uh, being knocked around. Um, there's a replacement cycle for that that we try to keep as well. Same thing with Taser, and the other, what will be a common theme here is that there's proprietary software, and at some point they stop um, giving updates. You have to buy the new hardware in order for the new software to work. Good thing I'm on that. We're not on Windows 7 like some people, but we're, um, you know, we're using pretty old equipment uh, that needs to be replaced. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. I'm just curious in general, with a lot of this equipment that's on a short window of replacement, what's What's done with the equipment that is aged out? Um, companies can bu buy it back. Um, there's companies who uh, live and breathe by buying uh, old equipment. Uh, and so oftentimes we look for companies like that to, to buy it back and we send the check to Mark and it goes in the general fund. Yeah, it doesn't go to offset future capital. It goes to the uh, sales state property and the operating budget. Oh. Right. We're talking small dollars, we're not talking thousands. Hundreds of thousands, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, similar to our police vehicles, by the way, that goes to auction and the city gets to touch. 
Um, okay, item number, uh, project number six, our portable radios. Uh, very similar, a replacement cycle, a lot of wear and tear. Um, asking for four um, radios for next year to replace uh, very old portable radios that are in existence. We uh, literally had to use black tape and, and be creative in, in keeping some of these together. Uh, as you can imagine, just getting in and out of a squad every day, uh, it, it bangs on things and it's no fault of the officers of what they're doing, it's just a, in the course of wearing a radio uh, for your job. Questions on that? Item number seven uh, is the arbitrator in-car video system. Uh, asking for a unit that goes in the squad car that uh, I'm also asking for, the F-150. Each of our patrol cars is equipped with an arbitrator in-car video system, which has forward-facing camera and it's got a camera for the, um, the what we call the prisoner portion, the rear portion. Questions? Okay. Number eight, this item is probably new to many of you. Maybe uh, Alder Thomas has seen this uh, before. I'm not sure how uh, Chief Ostringa acquired the two uh, ballistic shields we currently have uh, in service. Um, they're dated. Um, the shields we have are ballistic shields that uh, police utilize when going into high risk situations. Think bank robberies, think armed uh, offenses, anything involving typically a gun or knife. Um, we are trained, it's industry standard, uh, to utilize a shield whenever possible. Our shields were acquired in 2007, well beyond the manufacturer um, warranty date. Um, because they were purchased in 2007, uh, and if you all remember the North Hollywood shootout, a really horrific event in, in Los Angeles in which a couple of individuals robbed a series of banks and uh, were eventually captured and uh, stopped by law enforcement. Um, but uh, the industry changed for law enforcement uh, because of that. And one of the things that came of that was uh, SWAT shouldn't be the only tactical unit to have ballistic shields. Your police officer needs them because they're going to get there before the SWAT team. Uh, and shields are used to save lives. Um, the reason I'm, I, we're, we're due for more shields um, is because the industry standard again, and agencies all around us, there is typically a shield in every police car so that when you go to a call, you have that resource in, in the back of your police car. We currently have two. The two that we have are very, very heavy. Um, I can tell you that we recently went to training in which we learned a new method, the latest method of, of uh, shooting behind a shield, which is very important, obviously, for us to learn. Uh, we are one of uh, a handful of agencies that are part of a training consortium to include Verona, McFarland, Stolten, uh, York Department, is using the oldest shields out there. Uh, to the point where your officers are sort of poke fun of, okay? The shields are such that uh, the design is are ancient that we couldn't even do some of the trained maneuvers that they were trying to teach us because it didn't have the cutouts as this, this one does and demonstrates. Uh, you, we need new shields. Um, so I'm asking for two shields. You'll see this as a recurring uh, request until we get every squad car equipped. Questions so on the shield. How many will that involve total once you've replaced all of them? Uh, we have 14 cars in the fleet, okay. um, but my priority is patrol, to which we have eight cars. Okay. Um, and I will pause from having these big dramatic stories about how people make fun of us uh, once <laughs> I get my patrol cars and my patrol officers equipped. If the chief has a shield, that's something, Mayor, I think you can say, Chief, do you really? Uh, but you see me out there, Mayor. Uh, I, I might need a shield, too. Um, so the goal is uh, all of our squads, but patrol eight squads is my priority. Okay. Any other questions for the Chief? Brian, how much do the current shields weigh? Part of the challenge of me in pounds. having the idea to reorganize this room is that I can't hear you. I'm sorry. How, mu how, mu how many pounds do the current shields weigh versus the new shields? Thank you for asking that. The um, current shields, I think I put on here actually, yes, uh, 22 pounds and 24 Oh, pounds. I missed that. Thank you. Um, if you think about just picking it up and carrying yeah. it from one place to another, that's fine. If you think about hour-long standoffs, uh, that becomes heavy. When you think about utilizing one arm to do that while lifting it upright and having a weapon in the other hand, that's heavy. The newest shields are half that weight. There are some shields, for example, Oregon Police was using ballistic shields 
that are like my bulletproof vests. They actually roll up. That's how light they are. Yeah. So the, the new shields we'll be getting is, is will be half the weight of our current mm -hmm. shields. Any other questions about shields? <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm moving along here. Uh, number nine, uh, radar equipment uh, for the new squad. Forward and rear facing equipment. Radar is a, is a, a big tool for, for speed enforcement. Uh, oftentimes they get, well, Chief, why don't you just invest in, in handheld devices? That only works when you're standing still. Uh, oftentimes uh, speeders um, are logged and um, uh, stopped based on moving traffic. When the squad car is moving, they can capture oncoming traffic. Uh, as soon as that squad car comes to a stop, that officer can transition immediately the radar to detect people coming towards the squad and moving away from the squad. Uh, so radar is important and uh, there's a reason we utilize both handheld devices and uh, vehicle equipped devices. Any questions about the radar or anything else in the police budget? I'm just curious how often have you used the ballistic shields that you currently have? The ballistic shield? Yeah, did, does it, is it something that comes up once a month, once a year? More often than not, and the feedback from our officers is that they would grab the shields mm. if they were new shields. Mm. The shields are bulky, heavy, cumbersome. Um, they will grab them if they need them, and often I, I can give you a rate of maybe once a month, once every two months. And know that it's just not Monona calls. We're surrounded yeah. by the second largest city in the state that has a lot of violence. And so we're oftentimes the first mutual aid response, yeah. similar to what you hear the Chief McMullen talk about when on the fire going into the city, uh, that's us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're often put in these very dangerous situations. That can happen here, of course, and there's history, unfortunate history of violence happening here. Um, but we go to them a lot. And the officers have told me, and I believe them, Chief, if these things weren't, weren't so darn bulky and heavy and awkward to use, we would be using them a lot more. And they should be using them a lot more. And I get on them for not using them enough. But we have to give them the right tool to do the job, mm -hmm. to encourage them to use them and, uh, and to be safe. Thank you. Anyone else have any other questions about the police end of the budget? Now we'll move on to uh, emergency communications, which is on page 48. Thank you. This is our 24-hour dispatch center. I, the reason I bring 24 hours is because the computer is on 24 hours a day. We need a new computer. It's outdated. It's old. The reason it costs so much is because it's a high power. It's a highly powered uh, a computer, a specialty computer for uh, dispatch that needs a lot of memory, a lot of processing power. Uh, think of your uh, young kids that uh, want the best uh, gaming device in the world uh, so that they can play video games. We want it to dispatch police. Right, not Call of Duty? Not Call of Duty. Okay. <laughs> Questions? Doesn't look like it, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Next up is Parks and Rec. Mr. Anderson, um, I guess we'll start on page 83, which is Parks. Do we need a break, a stretching break? Can I leave you on some slides we, that will some get us through the rest of the evening? Actually, we're moving so fast that yeah, well, yeah, does yeah. anyone want to so take far. a break, or are you, or we could take another one after Jake, whichever you want one now. Okay. Okay, we'll take like ten minutes now. Is that okay? I think there's more pizza if anybody wants any or. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired. I've been pulled over. Have you ever been pulled over here? Um, are these guys still filming? <laughs> Just are they still Just filming? City limits and go. You don't see the big sign. Oh, see how fast okay. I gotta go before I pass it. <laughs>
talking about parks first on page 83. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, so our capital budget revolves a lot around safety and accessibility this year. Uh, in the coming months, at the end of October, in your first meeting in November, you'll hear about our ADA transition plan. That was in this year's capital budget, and that includes uh, uh, recommendations for compliance with federal ADA law. So our priority project this year is redoing the path in Winnicott Park. It's a ped bike path replacement going from Greenway Road, which is by the school, and connecting up to the skate park, which was done last year. Challenges with this existing path are it's pretty narrow for the multi-modal units that we have, bike, pedestrians, scooters, etc. cetera. Um, the path goes right along the tennis court and skate park, which makes it very difficult to do snow removal in the wintertime. Uh, and certainly the condition of the path is, is poor and is used daily by a lot of people. Um, snow removal from the school in the wintertime also pushes snow onto the path, so clearing it uh, gets to be a challenge where we have to do it multi -time, multiple times. So this project would be kind of pushing it in. Um, the, the boundaries between the school district property and city property are a little blurry, and that would be part of this is defining that, potentially obtaining an easement from the school if any of the path would still be on uh, school district property. It also coincides with the next project that I'll talk about with our Schaefer shelter improvements, but with a, with a lens towards accessibility and making our facilities ADA accessible, this is a great spot that we can host um, some of our athletics from baseball and soccer and flag football and provide off-street parking um, and bathrooms and accessible routes to those fields. So that project would be uh, engineered and constructed in 2023. Uh, just if you're looking at that, we did put it in there right now. You see another revenue of twenty-five thousand. So we're going to try to get <clears throat> these people who do these uh, race days because they use that path for their races, um, and they're used to bring people <coughs> in beds. Then maybe try to get them to do a good tourism grant and charge them for that. So we'll know by the time we borrow if that's true, yes or no. Um, so that is our. That is our goal to get that. Any other questions on that project? The path. Path right. project. Okay. Uh, Schaefer Shelter Improvements. Um, this project is just renovating the existing Schaefer Shelter. So we're using it currently for our summer camp program with about 50 kids per day. Uh, we still have adult softball that utilizes it, and then we have transitioned our other youth baseball and softball, our younger kids, so our t-ball and our coaches pitch. Um, the goal is that we consolidate uh, the programs of youth baseball and softball to those two diamonds specifically that is um, surrounded the Schaefer Shelter, so we anticipate using that uh, nightly um, for as long as you know, we can continue to have the shelter. The challenge for that shelter was built in 1988, so it is quite old. Um, it's got good bones to it. It does definitely need um, a sewage ejector pump replacement. So basically when you have a, a shelter that can't gravity feed to a, a sanitary line, you have a grinder pump that pumps it to the sanitary line. And there's two. There's always two and they can alternate. Well, one is, has completely failed. Um, and so we basically were running on a... <laughs> A wing and a prayer this year and made it through the season with it still working. Um, and so this project would include new siding, a roof, uh, ADA upgrades that will be included in the ADA transition plan that you'll be hearing about at the end of October, and some plumbing upgrades. Any questions about that one? I was, you kind of made reference to it, but um, I know we talked about that you're going to be uh, getting rid of the two Healy Lane softball fields so this would sort of go along with that consolidation because there just aren't as many people, kids and adults, playing softball or baseball. Correct. We have too many baseball, softball facilities for the demand that we currently have. Um, and being able to maintain those with everything else that we have is, is proving to be quite challenging. Uh, so 
we can coordinate how we schedule at those facilities and do them centered around kind of the Shaper Shelter, Winnico Park area, and Frostwoods, uh, and and continue to offer those programs. And so, uh, an investment in the shelter and a remodel, I think, is is worthwhile, um, not only for the use of you know recreational sports, but also our summer camp program and after school activities that utilize that area as well. Anyone else? Okay. All right, next project, continuing along with shelter maintenance and plumbing. Um, so Dream Park basically has the same issue as Schaefer, has a, an injector pump that's uh, halfway between the shelter and Healy Lane. It's quite deep, it's you know probably 15 feet deep. And we noticed last summer that <clears throat> one of the ejector pumps was not working and so we're kind of on that same band-aid solution unfortunately um, they do not make those grinder pumps anymore and so we can't just do a pump you know a one pump replacement on that uh, so we have to replace that um, a, a, a dual ejector pump there um, the sinks at Huska Park are basically falling apart and so we added that in as well. So just a, a shelter maintenance plumbing upgrades for those two facilities. Questions? Guess not. Okay, the next one is Grand Park Shoreline. So in 2018 with the flooding it eroded a lot of the existing small riprap was there. Um, causing some erosion. It, this is a small pocket park on Winnico Road, but a very popular fishing spot. Um, it's right at the channel that leads into uh, the Har River. <clears throat> um, so this project would be putting in some cut stone rock around the storm uh, water outfall, and that's similar to what we have at the lagoon, at the Winnico North Lagoon, where you can step down and, and uh, fish off of it. You could, you could launch a kayak if you wanted to, um, but really this is more of a passive uh, wreck and fishing area. We've had some uh, potential challenges with um, uh, encroachment um, from a property on this park and some disagreements over where the property line is, especially as it relates to how uh, people fish off the park. And so this would also include a boundary survey and uh, get some clarification on the little Island, I would say that's off, just off of the park to the to the north. Questions? No. Okay, the next one is annual. Uh, about every three to four years, we um, stain and paint the Winnipeg Dream Park playground. Um, this. Playground was built in 25 years ago. 25 years ago. So the company did do a report for us that's available if you'd like it. That just kind of goes over the condition of it and things that we could do. But generally, they were meant to last 20 years. And so we're getting towards the end and some very challenging discussions over potential replacement of the playground. But this will get us at least to that next conversation. Um, it also includes staining of the gazebo and repairs that need to be done at the gazebo as well. Um, both of those facilities are, are wood-based, so they're prone to vandalism, uh, some potential rotting um, that are both have heavily used in fixtures in the park. So this is a about every three to four years um, type of project. Did you say you did repair some of the railings at the gazebo? We did. We got half of them done on the lakeside and need to do the other half um, at the gazebo. Questions, anyone? Nope. Uh, next one is Maywood Park Master Plan. So as you're aware, we have uh, stormwater management projects and reducing phosphorus going into the lake. And so we've done some preliminary engineering on what it would take to um, comply with some of our permitting at Maywood Park. Um, and currently, the theory is that we would install an underground uh, detention basin like we did at Stonebridge. And so with that, we would have some park improvements as well. Uh, this master plan is typical of what we've done for other parks, public input, uh, surveys, um, coming up with a park improvement plan. I ideally, we're looking at connecting 
some of the ped paths that uh, have just been installed as of last week from the Winnipeg Road project. Uh, there is a, a portion of the park that actually um, goes behind the properties on Maywood to Nichols, so there's an opportunity there to um, connect some pedestrian walks in there. But this would be just a master conceptual master plan with engineering design in 24 with construction in 2025 to coincide with the um, stormwater improvements. And just so everybody knows, this is part of that Reach 64 project, and Dan will be talking about that have stuff in there too. Which I think at some point we will be doing an updated presentation to council about Reach 64, especially for new members um, who aren't aware of it, and just what, what that's going to entail in the coming years. Any questions about Maywood yeah. Park, Brian? So the master planning part, is this the the money only associated to the park side of it? Correct. And there's also master planning First money two. allocated for the storm side? There will be, right? Oh, yeah. Correct. Anyone else? Okay. Next one is an annual allotment for tree re removal and planting um, in one of the park. Uh, at your Monday meeting, we'll have an agenda item to approve us applying for a DNR Urban Forestry Grant to help offset some of the cost of uh, ash removal and replanting. Um, we're down to about 15 or so trees left in Winnipeg Park and all of them have significant signs of the ash borer if not completely standing dead. Um, given that this is our central park and, and premier park in Monona, um, we'd like to be able to get this done in one project uh, next year. This year was pretty successful in our microforest. We were able to plant uh, 45 uh, new trees, about half of them um, were, were donor trees where people did donors and did plaques. Um, we worked with the school district to plant um, little pine seedlings in that area as well. And so we're, we're looking at doing a majority of, of the work with um, this capital money at Winnicott Park and then the, the rest of the system as far as the park side, we're getting there. Um, we're probably within, I would say, three to five years of getting all of the ash trees out of the park system that have been infected. Um, and then we're looking at just the uh, newly planted trees and any other trees that may um, remove. Generally speaking, um, if we contract it out, uh, it's between $1,800 and $2,400 a tree. Um, so while the number, you say, oh, it's a lot of money for, you know, removing trees, it doesn't last that long. Um, Director Stefani's staff and our parks crew can do a lot in-house and take care of a lot, but that also takes a lot of time away from day-to-day -day activities. So we try to do as much as we can in the wintertime, um, but there are some that need to be contracted out, especially ones that are extremely large and taller than what our bucket truck can reach to. Questions, anyone? Continue, Jake. Okay, the last one in parks um, is just a standard item that we use for replacement of our bike racks, picnic tables, uh, trash cans, and signage we put in there for this year. So we've talked a lot at Parks Board um, about what park signs should look like, and not necessarily the park name sign, but park regulation signage. And currently we have probably five to ten different signs of what you should or shouldn't do in parks and whether it's dogs on leash or golf balls or no driving on the grass and so to develop a more comprehensive um, signage package would be a, a good chunk of what we'd use. Uh, picking cables, um, <clears throat> you know, we use wood that we paint. We know that they're, they're a little more maintenance heavy, but they're a lot less expensive than if we went to like a recycled plastic. We also move our picking tables around a lot for events. And so once you get um, those, they're very heavy. We have added, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, uh, probably about 12 to 20 new sets of picking tables. Uh, with the addition of San Damiano, you know, we've got a lot up there. Um, you know, at some of our other parks, we've had to add more because of use at those parks. So like Bridge Road, for example, pre-2017, we had maybe one picnic table. Now we have six. Um, and this also gives us some flexibility for when we do get um, people that donate money for a, like a memorial bench, for example, that we can, we can pay for the concrete pad that it sits on. So that's what this account is for. Questions? Yeah. Jake, Teresa. Did I? I seem to recall at some point that the picnic tables were made of wood 
from the trees that were cut? We have the material to do it. So we have about 3,000 board feet of ash okay. uh, sitting down at our public works garage right now. Um, we have to modify that material before we can use it for picnic tables. Okay. Uh, so eventually, yes. Uh, okay. We have to kind of wait till we can get a big enough to send it in a semi to the location where they do a thermal modification of the wood. But okay. Yes, we have salvaged a lot of our, our um, urban ash logs for that specific reason. And is that a time, a, is that a, a money saving? Uh, yeah. It really does oh, yeah. in the long yeah, run? Yeah, in the long it's... term that'll save a lot of money. Yeah. Um, depending on the, the overall cost to have them thermally modified, but you know, lumber prices this year were insanely out of yeah. control. And so even for the work we did at the gazebo, it was for six railings, it was I think $1,500, you know, for, yeah. well, that historically would have cost us 500 and so the, the lumber prices have kind of peaked in valley this year. And so, yes, long term being able to have some of that our, ourself is certainly a cost savings. So you've got the wood. I mean, cause I, I can understand how it would be just, it's just a touching story, but it's also financially beneficial, which is a win-win. That's great. But if I'm understanding, so you've got the wood, it's just not able to be used right now. Correct. It's still okay. got to air dry. Got it. So yeah. it's, it's got to get to a, a certain percentage of, of moisture content in the wood before yeah. it can take this thermal modification. Yeah. So. And how many tables could come of the wood that you have? 30, 40. Wow. That's fantastic. Least, yeah. And they would be assembled by public work staff or your Our staff? staff yeah. yeah. That's great. And you've used wood for other projects too. Correct. Right? Yes. Like in yep. Below deck. Yeah, below deck and yeah. sand is completely fantastic. Yeah. Har harvested urban wood. That's where I heard the story. Yeah. Anything else for Jake about the park portion of things, Doug? Yeah, I had a question on the uh, with the picnic tables and the benches. Are we going to be putting in any companion uh, seating areas for ADA accessibility and how that kind of relates to where picnic Correct. tables Correct. Yes, I think that's potentially with this, we could start knocking off maybe one of the parks a year. To, and, and so what we'll learn about in our ADA transition plan is, is providing spaces that are ADA accessible. So if you would have, for example, at Bridge Road Park, um, we add picnic tables that are just in the grass, one of those would have to be on a, on a hard surface area that's accessible by a wheelchair. So um, taking just an offshoot to put in a, a, a concrete pad or a crushed rock pad that we could put a picnic table on that had the seating area underneath. And then any of the bench areas that are along our, our paved paths need to have kind of a separate area. So if a wheelchair person was in that area, they could sit next to someone on the bench. Kathy. I'm, I'm not sure this is the appropriate time to ask this question, but I'm curious about when the apartment buildings go up and we get park fees. What do we do with that money? Does we that go to capital or does that go to operating? We spend it right away. <laughs> 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 no, the finance director Hotaker immediately <laughs> takes it off whatever project that we are working on next. Well, no, we, we have our own separate fund that we go into. There's no so what are we getting these days? Um, Not enough. <laughs> that's one thing we're looking at for the operating mm -hmm. budget okay. is part Not of the enough. fees for next year. I think that what is about fourteen hundred a unit, a unit right now. So we're looking oh, at the dedication, Parkland dedication fee. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, per unit. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I. It's, so like last time we had it, I think we used part of it for Lotus Park one time, yeah. and we used it for the Dream Park at one time. For the last two times we actually used, we received any. It's, it's a pretty hot button topic, and then my colleagues around Dane County, everyone's kind of asking each other and looking because. We're seeing this tremendous amount of, you know, apartment growth, and in a lot of areas they're not providing green space for their, you know, the new residents, and then our existing facilities have to kind of absorb mm. that population increase and how we can provide for that. Um, but at 14, you know, for let's say Fairway Glen was the last one that I think we got money for, yeah. um, and that was about fifty thousand dollars. So it doesn't go that far. You know, yeah, for it's one time and then right a one time yeah. fee, and then you know you want to mm -hmm. be able to make try to make improvements potentially in the area that those apartments are at. So, 
Um, but it doesn't have to be for that. Anywhere in the system it can be used. Is, How you, long has it been at 1400 it, There's an inflation factor, so it goes up every year based oh, on the okay. CPI. Okay. But it is complicated. To, to be able to change it, there's the legislature has sort of made it <laughs> more complicated. Shocking. Of, you know. Uh, yeah. I just think it's one of those things that we sort of, I don't want to say overlook, but as a group, you know, the, it's a fee and um, it's a burgeoning. I mean, we're more and more and more, and um, I just think we need to pay attention to how much and and um, what we're collecting and what's a reasonable amount, um, particularly since many of these people happen to also get TIF money to, to, fund, to fund their <laughs> things. Sorry. And um, I, I think it's something that, as a group, we need to, to take a look at to see if there's if we can do, think outside the box a little bit. But you know how I am, Jake. Yeah. Um, I would agree. I mean, it, you know, Fitchburg sitting at a balance of over seven million dollars in, in Parkland. Their parkland yes, is it impact? Imp fees? impact. Or is it actually no, it's uh, Parkland. It's, it yeah, uh, and parkland. so when we talk about park improvements, you know, regionally and look at what's being either bonded or DeForest, Wanakee, Fitchburg, Verona, everyone's doing park projects right now. Mm -hmm. There has been, a, but the financing and the way they're funded vary from community to community and the ones that have seen an explosive growth in in residential and in apartments are benefiting to be able to fund some of their park projects with those fees and we just haven't put you know enough apartment complexes in mm -hmm. to get that dedication it, to I mean, it the is balance. the wave of the future and mm -hmm. and they I, I think are using parks more than than their yeah. predecessors did and um, and sort of demand more services and gets them invested in the community more. So, um, yeah. absolutely. So, do you guys need to get going? Okay. <laughs> okay. If we're done with parks, um, next ninety six is that the community center? I think. Yeah. You want to explain this one? Uh, Diane explained a little uh, bit. Oh, okay, Diane talked yeah, a little bit. Okay. Not, we talked more about her part of it and not yours. Well, there's not much of mine left. Yeah, so it looked pretty good. <laughs> and you said it was okay. So, anyway. Uh, yeah, so the community center remodel, uh, Diane and I are convinced we will stay in this building for the rest of our careers. Uh, and so. We're working our way towards that. that It'll. Was, uh, that was my question. Yeah. Why are we putting money into the building? It'll tree? probably be but at least it's ten gonna years. It's going to be fifteen years. Okay. Before okay. We even talk about yeah. Got it. Least, so. like, like uh, you know, your favorite old shoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're trying to make it safer and more functional. Okay. Especially for, I know Jake needs some, some changes that could make it more functional for his staff too. But Diane's situation yeah. is just yeah. not great. And that stairway is. <clears throat> so in your packet, you have kind of plans. Um, if you want to see the full packet that was included for upgrades, and this is really cosmetic um, improvements other than a new stairwell. Uh, it's, it's redefining existing spaces in the building. Um, so I'm not going to touch on the senior center stuff. Uh, basically, we're in communication right now with the school district on a potential use of Maywood School. Nois Drummondo, as you know, is in their last year of their lease. Uh, we have an incredible um, amount of demand for childcare, specifically our after-school program and our summer camp program. We don't have the space to house all those kids in the community center. Um, we have 40 kids on a wait list this year uh, for after-school, and so that's 40 families that we weren't able to serve. Um, potentially, if things work out, we would be able to utilize Maywood uh, School starting in the fall of 2023, which would um, reduce the need to remodel some of the other spaces in the community center other than having a slight office reconfiguration and having some washer dryer. So we don't anticipate fully ever taking all of our programs out um, to Maywood, although we'd still have enrichment programs, et cetera, where we'd have kids in the building. Um, 
But as far as our needs are concerned, we're, we're hoping we can make something work with the school district on the reutilization of Maywood School um, for not only after school, but potentially early childhood um, programs as well. So it, as you may know, the, the 4K program at Winnicott used to be housed at IHM and had wraparound care. Um, there's no longer a MG 4K at IHM, so it's at the school and then kids are bussed over to wherever their child care provider site is. So that's another new uh, program that we're looking at helping the district with if we can negotiate a way to use Maywood. So the project at the community center is um, really just to try to get us through end of life, 10 to 15 years. Um, we did have more kind of invested into the main hall and the lounge area um, to make those those rooms, but with the, with the budget and the mayor's proposal, it reduced that amount to really focus mainly on the senior center with a few minor upgrades um, in a recreation office. I, I would, with a caveat, say we should know by January or February before we go out to bid about the status of Maywood School. So if something, if we don't get something worked out, I may come back and ask for a budget amendment. If it just looks like we are never going to make something happen with Maywood School and we have to use the community center long term, then we, I may ask if we can invest in that. And that's primarily for the kitchen, right? Yeah, the kitchen main hall area, yeah. But, of course, the big question with Maywood is how much it would cost. Them. Right. Correct. How we would fund that. So, right. But they're also, with the, if the public safety building project goes through, we're probably going to need some interim space right. for various departments. It would be great if we could use part of it for that, because Jake certainly does not need the entire school for right. this program. Um, I think it's so, a pretty exciting you know, yeah. opportunity to at least explore, because, yeah. I mean, there is so much demand for, the, for our programs. And certainly preferable to having that building sit empty right. and, and you know start degrading like it did uh, before. And I don't think the school district has any interest in selling it. Right. So, at least from what they've told us. Jake, has there been any calculations on like if we were to be if we could meet the demand? You know, if we could give all those families you know the services that they're looking for. I mean, are, are we talking about some significant income there? Like. It's significant. significant. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have that Enough available during our operating good. budget yeah. discussions, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. It's, it's it's north of a it's north of two hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars. I can tell you that yeah. annually. So, yeah. Um, However, Jake and I have an agreement that he will fully f he, he the income fully funds the staff and yeah. everything yeah. it costs because yeah. we're not going to pay for that. Important as I think it is from taxpayer money. Sure. So. Mm -hmm. for, Property taxes, anyway. Yeah. Right. And then Jake, the architectural uh, pictures here. Um, you said until end of life. Like, how many more years does the building have? Well, well it depends on when we when we can fix the public safety building. We didn't have heat the other day, and uh, awesome. well, it's not that cold in here. Luckily, it was just a. Smaller yeah. fix, but okay. Uh, I mean, the, the the structure of the building is built like a tank. I sure. Mean, the structure of the community center, it's it's really just the layout and the um, it just does not uh, suit the type of program yeah. that both the senior center and the park and rec. You know, currently are offering, and in the future will offer. So it's and it was built for 60 years ago. Yeah. You know. Era. Yeah, I know, Brian. Yeah. This question, Brian. Yeah, um, so I see it's for the for upstairs. It's for the office reconfigurations and the washer and dryer. Is that is the washer and dryer the ones that are over in the kitchen, but not the whole kitchen redo? Correct. So it's just a washer and dryer unit. Correct. In so the current space, no changes to the space. Yeah, and we would probably actually put that in the storage space, which there's a, a room right next to the kitchen that used to have a walk-in yep. cooler yeah. and our ice maker, and that was really for events that were happening. So since then, the ice maker's been pulled. The cooler is no longer functioning. And so so it was just storage for and tuck it in it, correct. Okay, so this, your portion is really the office reconfiguration. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. So is that everything for the community center? That's it. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, what's the next? The pool. The pool. One.
page 16. Okay, there's three projects uh, that made it in the mayor's budget for the outdoor pool. Uh, the first being the biggest priority is our main pump replacement. Um, we have two main pool pumps. Uh, in case one goes bad, we can swap out the other one in less than a day, keep the pool up and running. The one did have a, a prop problem when we started up that we used last year. Parts are no longer available, and it's just it needs to be replaced. Uh, so we did go the whole year with um, the newer of our two pumps, which was purchased in 2015, was the last pump that we purchased. So this would kind of be another pump to get us through the end of the pool life, which would probably be about the same time frame as community center. Um, the locker room doors, uh, just a couple replacement of doors going into the locker rooms. They're rusting out at the bottom, creating safety hazards for bare feet, um, knocking into them. Hollow metal doors painted, installed. And then deck furniture, replacement of our deck furniture. Um, also, we have different kinds of furniture. We're experimenting with armless uh, lounge chairs, which uh, seemed was a request of several of our park board members. And um, I think they went over pretty well this year. <laughs> it's got their own. Uh, what they like at the pool. But that's just kind of an, you know, we cycle through deck furniture on an annual basis. Is that it for the pool? That's it. Anything, any questions for Jake about any of the pool? Did you want to talk about any items that was cut? There's only one item cut, right? From for the, the pool. pool, right. Yeah. We moved it to next year. Yep. A new pool? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And offer wish. a friendly amendment to that referendum question to add another <laughs> a community center and a sixty pool. million dollars yeah, exactly. for a pool yeah. and a community center. Yeah. Uh, no, the only other thing that I, I would like to talk about that is the, that will come out of the ADA transition plan is we did put funding for design and engineering for Huska Park improvements. Um, the mayor and I have had a lot of discussion <laughs> and debate about it, and it didn't make for budget. And uh, you know, I. It, it made the budget, it just was pushed Correct. back. Correct, it pushed here. back. Mm -hmm. I worry about losing, kind of balancing um, improvements in our park system with kind of the public safety uh, dollar amount and where those improvements, is, especially in regards to ADA accessibility, fall in and not trying to get Winnicott and Huska lined up in the same year or every pushing them so far back that they don't get done. Uh, Ahuska Park is, and I am guilty of this. It's, it's sometimes it's forgotten about, right? Mm -hmm. It's off the off of our central nucleus, but it is our most visible park by the number of vehicles that pass by it every day on Broadway and the Beltline. It's also our most frequented um, uh, regional park for athletic events and farmers market. Um, and so some of the ability to get people safely into those sites, the baseball field, the football field. And the playground is now over 20 years old as well. So um, that project is, you know, design phase with the potential of a three quarter of a million dollar construction project in 2024 is where we originally had it. Uh, there is some grant possibilities with this project, potential TIF funding. Um, I just, if if we could forecast out three years and give guarantees on when things happen, we don't do that though. We only have next year in the capital budget process. And councils change and priorities change and we've really kicked the can on both kind of bigger term investments in, in Winnicott and Bahuska um, because they're challenging. It's hard to kind of figure out and we really need to see what the, this report says. The, re, we, the report for ADA is, is done. I will send you a link. It's a lot of information and, and probably just don't worry about it until we have our consultant come and do the presentation and kind of guide us on, on what to look for. Um, but I do strongly feel that in, in effort to, to make sure that we're providing accessible spaces for all, that this is a, a, a good project. Uh, and I do think it's a, it's a grant eligible project um, that hits a lot of points that this federal 
grant project is, is looking for an active rec. And there is a, I think there's a possibility and a potential that we can look to fund at least the engineering design is project and wait to see where the status of the grant is. So it's a May 1 grant application, August, September uh, notification period. If we get the grant, you can start design. What kind of percentage would the grant be? It's a 50%. Up for the to 50, design, up to 50. for the engineering? Well, it, it would include, yes, it can include. So it would be like 25000 are you saying? Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, it's a 50% grant that engineering is included. So I, I do think and there's a con And construction? Correct. 50% okay. of the $700,000? Yeah. There's generally the state gets two to three million dollars a year from the National Park Service for this grant program. Um, some are larger projects, some are smaller, and some are medium. This would be like a medium sized so project. It's two to three million available for the whole state. For the whole state, right. So it's a competitive, mm -hmm. you know, grant program. There's no guarantees, obviously. Um, but we could apply for it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Kathy? As important as I know parks are to this community, Part of my concern is that if we start talking about those projects before we settle public safety, this community is going to, we just bought, we, we just bought San Damiano, now we're going to do the public safety, and this community is saying my water, my power bill is going up 35%. Um, this community does not have an appetite to slow down. And I fear that if we bring too much stuff up too soon, they will clash with each other, particularly because the school district will also be talking about a referendum. So I think we need to be very careful about how we pace this stuff. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you, Jake. I, it's, it's a, to me, it's a matter of timing. That uh, and I and I caution us all. I, you know, this community is is um, and and it, there's sort of a cue that you have to get in line and and um, we we need to do. We we are so I, it, it's so frustrating. I think because we are we are landlocked. Our ability to have development and do things creates so many challenges for this body to do it and um, they need to know that um, we are modest in our demands on what we need and we are thoughtful in how we do it and I just think we need to be very cautious about the timing on how we proceed to bring up future I mean I, we need a community center we need a pool there's no question about that but but they need to I think they need to wait in line quietly. That's just my view of the world. Well, and if I could explain my and Mark's take on the Hoska Park project, I don't doubt that it needs to be done. Um, but obviously, to throw a seven hundred to eight hundred thousand dollar project in the same year, we if the referendum passes, and that's a big if, um, you know, that's just a ton of money, which is why we pushed it back a bit. Plus, if this North Point project goes for goes forward on the um, Whitehorse property then we'll have not only the parkland fees mm -hmm. from that but plus Mark thinks we could fold it into the TIF the TIF for the infrastructure yeah and the community. so to me that's all the more reason to delay this for another year or two that's that was our reasoning so wouldn't the timing of that though work similar with the grant that we'll know about North Point if we go ahead and put the money in for the design, we'll know sometime, I, you know, mid. Hopefully, we know this year, although there's yeah. various debates going on on the right. Planning Commission about departments and things. Right. <clears throat> well, the North Park uh, point, their GDP has already been passed, and their PIP has had a single read. Um, with positive feedback because it was consistent with the GDP. So there isn't any anticipated concerns about that current approved GDP and progressing PIP. Um, there's some, of course, pieces that need to be worked out. There's a private like drive. The, there's a road, yeah. That's I mean, there's a few major kind of hurdles issue. that have to get addressed, but 
the development itself is uh, moving forward as expected. So it would be within the matter of the next couple of years, yeah. right? They're planning open 2024, I believe, was, is their tentative plan. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't mind funding the engineering, but with the understanding that we're not funding $700,000 for the work if we have a public safety building and we haven't been able to work out this TIF support of the project. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, that, that's my concern. It's making, to me, if we fund the engineering, then we're making the commitment to spend the money. And, and you've had a master plan done, correct? Just yeah, recently. we do have a completed master plan yeah. for that part. Though. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. not in 2019. Yeah. End of 2018. Yeah. Early yeah. 2019. So that's building off that, which gives you yet another kind of, it's a, it's a plus point in the grant application process if you have a, an approved master plan. Yeah. Um, would engineering dollars for this if the grant were to go forward uh, would this be something that would be considered something that could go to the tourism for a grant since this is a regional park that attracts mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean that's the whole point of this park is being a regional park the the I mean it's an argument that we can bring you're the chair right or you're at least on the commission <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, somebody somebody could put together a proposal and bring it to that group. Yeah. There are elements that we have discussed the among funding, other yeah. organizations on what we can do at Huska. To, if, if it's not in and of itself that we would bring events to the park that would include infrastructure improvements as part of this package. So yes, that is absolutely the goal is to bring as many um, events that include infrastructure improvements in our parks uh, that would generate hotel stays and be eligible for tourism grants. Perfect. Which, this is kind of my mantra about everything. If we can figure out a way to use, to justify some tourism money, because we have a lot of tourism money yeah. that, yeah. unfortunately, we can't spend on what we really need it for. So, um, anyway, that's a whole other topic. Yeah. But So, anybody else? Mm -hmm. Thank you okay. Thank you, Jake. Uh, Dan, does anybody need another break, or are we all good? No. Okay. Brian, do you need a break, Brian? No. No. Okay. Okay. Only <laughs> about three hours. Yeah. <laughs> Just. Uh, no. Brad, Brad is by Zoom right now, so oh. I think put Brad on the, uh, the Zoom. Link. Sure. Do you want to? Well, because Brad's going to be talking about Brad. With Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Is that possible? Yeah, I have a little laptop. Okay. It's a wing song. You talk about person sitting there? Uh oh, a wing song. Oh. It's a wing song. He's trying. He's I'm sure that isn't true. He just thought this would be fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, I see Brad there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're starting with that. Love your background, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> Page 50. Is that what he's doing with all those signs that he's got <laughs> left over? <laughs> Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> so page 50, is that right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and Dan and also gave us a separate sheet. Yes, right? I'll explain that once we get to the equipment. Okay. Uh, so, it's good and so I've asked Brad to attend. Um, I usually do the majority of this alone, but Brad has been uh, helping with uh, a number of projects uh, the past few years, and the ones I've asked him to cover with me assisting uh, tonight would be the Atwood project, the DPW garage facility repairs for the heaters, the bike wayfinding, the residential LED light replacement, and the Reach 64. Brad's got a, a more of a historical background in those projects um, as he's been assigned to those the, the past few years. So, um, but I'll start out uh, covering the bridge and street maintenance. Uh, this is our, our annual uh, chip seal and mill and overlay program. Um, 
we're seeking, we're down to 183,000. I believe this was uh, a portion that the mayor uh, did some reduction to. Um, we're looking at about 175,000 for chip ceiling and 8,000 for uh, the sidewalk and curb repairs. We do need to find either an added line item in the project budget for uh, the South Bridge Road and Broadway Frontage Road. That is actually in there something. It must have. So is, is that going to be part of this funding package? Yeah, so it's, okay. yeah if you look at this, 183 is the general portion. And okay. 70 is the tip portion. So you that make sure the, yeah. that gets updated. To yeah, the, so, okay. I don't know, just, yeah, so the total is 253. Okay. So if, if that uh, demolition and development is a go, that $70,000 would be targeted to mill and overlay and resurfacing uh, that portion uh, south of Broadway. Uh, are there any questions? Any about questions? Mm -hmm. What's that? Brad, do you want to cover Atwood? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, the Atwood project is a reconstruction project from the uh, intersection of Cottage Grove Road and Firstland to um, the edge of the city's limits, which is the um, at the end of the parking lot at the Monona East Side Businessmen's Club. Um, the reconstruction project is 60% funded through federal grants. It's a cooperative project and being led by the city of Madison. Um, it's about 1,000 feet. Uh, which includes um, complete reconstruction in some locations, uh, mill and overlay in others, um, or not a mill and overlay, removal of concrete uh, pavement and replacement with asphalt pavement, um, replacement of curb and gutter, replacement of street lights with uh, matching LED street lights to those that are on phase two section of Manon Drive, which is the typical uh, LED street light that the city of Madison uses. Uh, some uh, buffer bike lane on the Monona side, uh, sidewalk improvements in, in many places, uh, just a complete replacement. Uh, adjustments to the medians, adjustments to the curb ramps uh, to make them ADA compliant and uh, uh, restriping uh, for the Bonanno Drive uh, section, which is about 675 feet um, uh, north, if you will, of the intersection and Cottage Grove Road. So the pavement doesn't come out there, but we restripe all of that and realign the intersection. And then it also is, include, is going to include a uh, bike crossing down at the light on Bonanno Drive or at Cottage Grove Road. Um, so that bikes can get from Atwood across Cottage Grove Road, which now has the bike lanes in it. And that's pretty much it for that. It, it also includes some sanitary um, improvements in storm sewer. Questions? This is quite a bit lower than what we originally thought it was going to be. Didn't we think it was going to be seven or eight hundred thousand? I think. Yeah, I think they empty a little bit more money or something. Put more money into it or something. The grant money and everything has yeah. been. Yeah, I, it may be because it's up to the sixty percent, uh, which is the standard that we've set at the MPO, but we haven't always been able to reach. Yeah. So, so that's wonderful. Teresa, did you have a question? Yeah, I don't want to open up a bigger conversation. I just want Brad, what what kind of a bike lane did you say it was? A buffered bike? It's a buffered bike lane. Um, okay. It has its buffer and that uh, kind of scales down to one and a half and then down to just a regular bike lane. Um, our right of way is so tight yeah. in that court right. that there, there's simply not enough room to do anything else. Right. There will be a separate bike lane on the other side, though, correct? On the Madison side? Or There's actually, actually a separate path, path right? Yeah. Yeah. right? Going both directions. Yep. Right. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Moving on, the next uh, item for Public Works uh, the Lagoon de Nord Preliminary Engineering. Uh, we we discussed this uh, briefly 
a few weeks ago uh, mm -hmm. when we accepted the grant uh, for the bridge replacement. Uh, we'll be doing four years of um, engineering, a few years of preliminary engineering. Next year will be the first year. Uh, 24 through 26, uh, those, those dollar figures might be rebalanced better once we get started with the engineering, but as of right now, we're seeking 32500 for next year. Uh, just to get started, we'll be picking an engineer and uh, doing the basic uh, preliminary engineering. So, any questions for that one? Okay. Next item after that would be the local road reconstruction. Uh, last year I presented two groups, a, a group A and a, a group B. Uh, we're going to move forward with group A next year. Uh, sections on Tony Watha Trail from Baskerville uh, to Wild Haven. We're seeking a full reconstruction. Tony Watha Trail from uh, Wild Haven to Winnicott Road. We're going to do a mill and overlay. No main replacement there. Um, we'll have some water valves that we're going to replace. On Arrowhead Drive, uh, Bokes Road, uh, or Bokes to the end, uh, full reconstruction. Dan, can I ask, is that boats south or north? I, I assume it's south. Um, that is going to be, you mean Arrowhead? Or Arrowhead, yeah. yeah there's, um, there's a section on Arrowhead that is also accessible, um, but that is, I believe, uh, um, just did, like I said, that, that section from Volks to the end is going to be full reconstruction. It's just that Volks Arrowhead, Volks cuts Arrowhead in half. Yep. Goes yep. Both, it, so you're not doing the section along Arrowhead Park, are you? No. Yeah, because we did that yep. at some point. Yep. Okay, so it'd be so. Um, but there is an accessible uh, portion uh, in that in that stretch. Uh, Wild Haven to Volks does not have curb and gutters, so about 610 feet will be assessed. And then on Volks Lane. Uh, Winnicott Road to Tony Watha Trail, we're going to do a full reconstruction and we're going to add new water main in that area and also replace cast iron. Right now um, there is a gap and we're going to close that gap and loop it, which will provide better water flow in that area. So we're seeking 295000 for design and uh, in 24 construction. Questions? The driver of this project is, is water main breaks. Um, just in my time here, uh, past 11 years, I think we've had s somewhere around five or six main breaks in this, this area. So, And the road's in terrible condition. And the road's in terrible condition. Yeah. What? So, okay. is, there a, is there a theory behind why so many water mains are breaking it's in that area? Water main. It's just the, the material yeah. that the water yeah. main is and that, made of, which is going to be replaced. Yep. And is that kind of, that's the original water that's main, the original isn't it? Water main. Okay. Yeah. So it's, what, 60 years old or? Uh, something like that. Yeah. Uh, the replacement would be ductile iron. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll upsize the main and it'll be a much stronger main. Yeah, so. nice. Next item, uh, we're seeking uh, funding again to, to continue, continue the ash tree uh, removal program uh, for street trees in the right of way. Um, I believe this was bumped back up to seventy-five thousand. Yeah, had that down to fifty thousand. Just so you know, I, so there's there were stumps in the just regular tree replacement, and we moved that to the ash trees. More. To this account. Yeah. Okay. That was something the uh, public works committee did add. So um, it looks like it was kept in there. So yeah. Good. Okay. We uh, we're doing pretty good on the ash tree re tree removal. Um, I, I say we can remove about 50 to 75 trees for this amount, but it all depends on the, the diameter or the size of the tree. We've been re, uh, eliminating about 100 to about 110 trees a year so far, so we're, we're getting a very good bang for the dollar here. Um, so we still have quite a bit more to go every year uh, until we can uh, uh, I guess eliminate all the dead ones. Uh, we'll be coming back uh, for funding. So, okay. mm. questions. any questions on this one? Okay. Nope. Uh, Brad, the next one would be for you, uh, DPW garage facility. So this is a this is part of a, a two approach to addressing the uh, some of the significant issues that have been found over time at the public works garage. Um, I don't know, a lot of you weren't on the committee or the council at the time where 
I presented the um, building envelope um, inspection results, but the Public Works garage has um, keepers and heating equipment that dates back to the um, mid-1980s to late-1980s. Uh, it's at the end of its useful life. Some of the equipment is currently malfunctioning and or just not working at, at all. Um, the ceiling fans, for the most part, half of them work, half of them don't. It is a probably a 20-foot tall ceiling on the interior, so trying to get the heat down towards the ground and or to distribute air so that it feels cooler and is less humid and just more comfortable in the summertime um, doesn't work very well with the ceiling fans that we have, especially when they're malfunctioning. Um, so this is uh, an, an, an effort to prioritize the heating component of this. Uh, the second phase would be the roof. Um, some exterior work. Uh, in, uh, some random items. Um, so uh, this is also an effort. Uh, we just redid the ventilation system to so it meets code. Uh, it used to not function automatically, so fumes could build up inside the building. Um, ventilation system would only kick on if you turned it on manually. And now that it turns on automatically in the wintertime, it cools off very quickly inside the building, which basically makes the heaters run constantly. Um, as an effort to fix that, we will bring in some makeup air combustion heaters. Um, and seeing the old thermostats and uh, putting in just more efficient heating systems. So this should hopefully reduce the cost to heat and or distribute air in the building and overall just make a more pleasant working environment for the crews. Questions, anyone? So I have a question. So Public Works Garage. Could go away. Oh, the, so this is we, this is not the graduate no, here. This is the, uh, oh. That's the fire like, department base that used, it used to be the, to be the public. Oh, that's we, we could entertain that if you want. <laughs> 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 with the new building as well. <laughs> this is down next to the dog park. Got it. Thank you. Glad to know you're a supporter. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. All right. Open my anyway. Did you want a hot tub in that building? <laughs> 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 All right, next item, uh, <coughs> the Elder Leopold Tellurian Drive Repaving. We did have money allocated in the budget this year for that, uh, 165000 uh, We will be uh, reallocating that um, as, as part of this total as well. That was put on hold this year to iron out some, some issues in the contract with both Elder Leopold and Tellurian. Right now, the city is only responsible for snow removal of the long driveway going in, uh, but we have been doing some shoulder repair work, pothole patching, and some uh, occasional infrared patch heating. Um, it, uh, it looks like we want to partner with them and upgrade or, or modify the contracts to assist with uh, redoing the entire driveway. Uh, so this work includes um, redoing the entryway apron uh, if you've been through there lately, you know that the apron's uh, quite cracked and needs replacement. We would pulverize the old asphalt, use it as roadbed material for the new, uh, I don't want to call it a driveway, it's a private road, if you will. Um, it would be asphalt, and uh, we are initially looking at about two asphalt speed humps, not speed bumps, but speed humps to control speed through there. A lot of children, a lot of school buses, a lot of walkers, and uh, I think the goal is to keep traffic about 10 to 15 miles an hour, and they can get up to almost 20, 25 on that stretch right now. So that would be part of it as well. Site, design, uh, site survey and design is about $22,000. Bidding services are around 5,000. Construction staking, administration, conservation around 13. Construction around 205. And then, like I said, we'd have 165 carryover to spend from this year. Yeah. So. so basically our plan, it also includes the apartments at the end of the there, driveway. Right. We, do, we, we are planning some stormwater improvements there. Uh, that's why the asphalt is 
has been degrading. We don't have proper stormwater control. Uh, so the plan includes doing some modification there as well. Plus now we have Woodland Park up there too. Right. So we do have some costs involved in there too. Right. So, that is yeah. so we're hoping to split the costs four ways and, and in our agreements with those organizations. Yeah. So it says that they're yeah. So one is Tolarian pays rent, so we're looking to increase their rent. And then um, although Macy has like a uh, payment load called pilot payment load taxes. So we're looking at that. So we're working with Bill and getting all this all stuff. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? I have a question. Could you speak more, Dan, could you speak more to the other revenue associated to this project? Yep. That 165 that you see, that's the money that we had budgeted this year in this year's road maintenance budget. Um, so we didn't spend that, so it's a carryover. So we already borrowed it. We're yeah. just going to use it next year. Okay. Yep. Okay, moving on. Uh, Brad, the LED... Were we on uh, wayfinding or LED streetlights? Streetlights. Streetlights. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brad, you want to take that one? Yeah, so this is a project that's been in the works um, for uh, several years. Uh, we've been trying to work with MGD, and uh, we finally broke through this year um, to get something planned for 2023. Uh, this would include replacing upwards of 75 residential streetlights in the northern half. Um, of the city, going to try and t uh, to segment the city into three phases for residential streetlights. I mean residential as in the wood poles that hold streetlights um, that are specifically in residential areas. So this wouldn't include any of the commercial areas or, or uh, like South Town Corridor or, or anything like that. So um, this would substantially improve the amount of actual light on the ground, and it will reduce the amount of light up into the sky. Uh, it will reduce the amount of power usage that the city uses for light. Um, I, I, th I thought I saw uh, the operating budget for 2023. I think there was somewhere around $75,000 or something like that in there just for street lighting uh, to power our lights. So. I could be wrong, but it's, it's a significant amount um, of reduction overall. Once we finish the overall project, which is around four phases, um, we'll be looking at upwards, if not much higher than 30% reduction in the actual overall operational energy consumption for the municipality, just for lights. Two questions. Um, First of all, Doug, I was at a meeting the other day where they uh, talked about a couple different communities. I think some Prairie was one. That's had right. gotten some kind of a grant for LED replacements through MPO. Right. Um, and I guess we didn't know anything about that. So or if we did, we... I didn't mean I... Pardon, yeah, had I didn't, you heard about it? I hadn't I, heard, I hadn't about, heard it about it. Um, until you mentioned that email. So I, I was wondering if... Yeah, I think, I think some, it's some, you know, something new that since... The money, you know, additional funding came of the uh, bill law. The, uh, Does it qualify for that? Something that I don't know. I mean, Should we talk to Bill? Yeah. Schaefer, um, would he be the person to, or who would be the? We, we could reach out to Bill. Yeah, uh, reach out to yeah. him. I hate yeah. to tell you who, who to talk to if it's not him. Yeah. I know uh, Brad had mentioned that. Um, I think you mentioned, Brad, uh, LED street lighting upgrades for Nichols Road uh, coming up in the future. I think you, you mentioned the grant covers that as well. Um, That's correct. Has, I, we'll touch base with Bill on if there's another grant for LED street, street light conversion. There's a, there's a program yeah. for it called. That's what, that's yeah. what it seemed like. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I can email him tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Any questions? Well, All right, Brad, you want to take on the bike wayfinding signage? Yep. This is another project that's been in the works for a couple of years, too. Um, we, we have a bike wayfinding plan for the project between the Dane County, the Madison area, municipalities. Um, the goal being that no matter what city you ride through, whether it's on the loop or other interconnected pathways and routes, the wayfinding signage for those routes is all um, 
the same or similar, so you know what you're looking for. Uh, currently, the city's bike wayfinding has a lot of gaps, um, and there's a lot of new riders, a lot of recreational riders, uh, especially using the B-cycles, that uh, it have been observed in many instances. They don't know where they're going. They don't know where they're at. Um, trying to read off the phone while riding through traffic, uh, blowing through stop signs because they're not paying attention or they don't know where they are. Um, this would be an effort to try and um, you know reduce those those close calls and uh, enhance the routes through the city of Monona. And you know, hopefully, potentially bring more riders, and hopefully, um, help with like families and stuff like that. They want to get out and ride. So it's a, it's just it's another part of our active living campaign that was started as part of the you know, university projects. So. Questions? Anyone? Is there is there a benefit to doing this now? Did I understand you correctly that there's something that makes it important to do this this Next year? year you mean? Um, the half of the, if not almost all of the latent route has and will be essentially completely resurfaced by the end of this year. And so this also has the a little bit of extra fluff in it to help um, add some striping to the roadway. And so the goal is that the entire Lake Loop route through Monona um, will be completely signed, striped, and essentially you know, finished um, by the end of next year. If we do this now, that's what we get. We get the whole package if we, if we keep this in the budget this year because it goes together with something else that's happening this year. It, it, it finishes off of our um, resurfacing projects, yes, and okay. specifically on the lake. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, right away, trees. Okay, last item for the general fund portion uh, for public works, the right away tree planting. Uh, this is at 25000 uh, The stump grinding allocation uh, was moved to the ash tree line item. Uh, this is here every year. Uh, we try to replace trees in areas that have open terrace or areas that we've removed trees where we can plant new trees, where the tree canopy wouldn't, uh, I guess, drown out new trees. But um, this money gets spent uh, pretty much all of it every year with uh, the new tree plantings. Uh, we'd like to keep that going. Brian? I just want to add that one of the one of the recommendations out of the committee regarding this, and, and Dan can attest to this, that there was a desire of more a, a much closer alignment to a one-to-one -one removal replacement, even mm -hmm. though there's an understanding of you can't take a tree, grind this up, put another tree there. Like <laughs> a recognition of there might be some movement, but trying to get closer to a one-to-one -one replacement. Um, and that's why we were a little bit more aggressive with the stump yeah. grinding. Um, recognizing that some of that work might not be able to be done but in-house it might need to be hired out right we're, we're a little bit behind we yeah. remove more than we replace exactly so. yeah I think we typically have about a hundred stumps waiting on the list um, we try to do as much as we can mixed in with the other work that we do but um, it's always something that kind of gets pushed to the back because of everything else so and whenever you do plant a new tree, then you go back and water it for the first year. We too, do. Right, so mm -hmm. that takes yep. mm -hmm. additional time yep. uh, involved. Yeah, we send the watering truck out uh, um, as needed. We're out now. We just planted a round of new trees throughout the city, so uh, the truck is out as needed, bringing those through the fall, and we'll be back out in spring watering them again. So, mm -hmm. Doug? Yeah. Um, just wondering, do you know if our the amount that we've been spending on right of way tree planting like how it how does it compare now to say before we started having to take out all the ash trees I don't think we've increased the um, the planting budget I think it's that we've been holding steady on that um, 
So obviously, it would seem to me at some point we're going to need to increase that right. if we're ever going to, you know. You need to make up for all the ash. The one, the right. one, right. And make headway on that. I think we talk about this, I think it's almost every year we bring it up. And I don't think your crew can keep up as part of the issue. So whatever we don't spend, we put it in, we set it aside and put it in the tree replacement basically like a tree replacement fund. So whatever gets carried over, there is right. money that does get carried over. Um, we, we typically plant twice a year. We do a spring yeah. and a fall planting. Um, yeah. I think that is that has been more of the issue is them not having the time to plant more. Right. Kathy? So um, if any of the trees that we are replacing are in a TIF district, can we fund them out of TIF? TIF trees. <laughs> if it's part of uh, the actual original project, but if it's just—I I just think that we, you know, if they're in the TIF district and it's to improve the TIF district, um, and that that we ought to be able to fund it out of TIF and and not and not put it on yeah. not put it on the geo one. That just yeah, know, take a look at Check that it out and see if we can do it. Yeah. You know how I like to think. <laughs> <laughs> Always thinking of TIF. Okay, anything right. else about the trees? Okay, Dan, you're going to move on to utilities? Yes. Uh, into the water utility. Uh, this next one, uh, skate improvements. I'm going to do my best to talk about this. Uh, this is one of those is that's usually over our heads because we don't know IT and uh, all the controls and stuff. But... Um, mm -hmm. The SCADA system uh, for the water, uh, we, we've, we've been with L.W. Allen as our integrator, I think since 1986. We were one of their first customers, and I believe their shop is on Tompkins, um, just down the road from us, so they're right out our back door. And uh, they've, they've helped us every year since 1986 up to now. Um, They've, they've provided all the replacements, um, any maintenance that's needed. And this work, too, would be um, work that we would seek L.W. Allen to do. Uh, we had allocation uh, for 2022 that, um, that kind of took a sharp left turn um, from what we were planning because of the supply chain and the microchip uh, shortage, uh, not only nationwide, but I believe worldwide. Um, we reallocated that to replacing the radios, which would have, have, have had to have been done next year. Um, so we're doing that this year. It's a, a serial radio system upgrade that we're currently doing instead of the PLC um, uh, that we were supposed to do this year. We're going to do that next year, and that's what this funding request is for. Um, I have a detailed list here. Of, of replacements uh, throughout the water system. The master telemetry unit that is located at the shop. And uh, I know we need to do a public works tour. Uh, we have several new members who haven't seen the shop, but um, it's housed in the office behind the locked door. Uh, that's our master control unit that controls the entire water system uh, and the sanitary sewer pumps and, and the stormwater pumps. We're also looking to add, uh, under option A, a computer that backs up the, uh, the master unit. Uh, we don't have that. That would be an addition. And uh, the benefit there that, that we would get out of that is if, we, if the master unit goes down, we would be down uh, an automatic controller until it can be ordered and replaced. So it, it could be a few months. Not only that, but all the historical data that we, we use to submit our monthly DNR reports would be lost. Having a backup computer keeps all those historical data, all that historical data, and uh, we would continue to be able to submit our monthly reports to the DNR. Um, so that, that's at the shop. At uh, well one, actually well one, two, and three, it's all pretty much similar. Um, Remove the old PLCs, putting in new PLCs. What is um, a PLC, then? Programmable logic controller. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> Whatever that brain means. Box. <laughs> yeah, things okay. that 
that I don't know. Yeah. IT. Thank you, Ben. Uh, it includes a panel view, uh, which allows us to interact, push buttons, see see the data, see uh, uh, the water tower pressures, um, turn on and off pumps, things like that. Um, like I said, the same would be at uh, all three wells. And then uh, we have uh, elevated tower control panel, uh, providing a PLC there as well. Um, this would be uh, a long-term upgrade, uh, as I have in paragraph three, the improvements expected life is about 15 to 20 years uh, along the way with other minor maintenance, but uh, this is, this is the, the stuff that, that operates the system. Um, the master control unit was last installed in the year 2000, so uh, not a bad run. Uh, for for all this all this hardware, so we're seeking one hundred thirteen thousand two hundred ten dollars to make these major scale upgrades in the water system. Questions for Dan? Okay. All right. Moving on. The. Next item would be the large water tower improvements. This has been something that we've been uh, working on since 2019. Um, the driver of this, this project uh, that we've been having a hard time with is we have one water main that, that runs up to the large water tower and the small water tower. And uh, you know, it's a couple hundred feet that if something happens, we don't have a water tower. We have three wells, uh, three reservoirs that we would be able to pump from the aquifer, pump from our reservoirs, have their booster pumps running, but we would be running around the clock supplying pressure to the city. Um, the goal, the main goal with uh, this large water tower improvement project is finding a way uh, to run another main. Um, so if something happens to the, the original main, we have a backup main that can continue to supply water to the system. We are on our fourth uh, review of another location that we can run the main. We ran into obstacles at every other location that we've looked at. Uh, going up the, the main driveway, uh, we, we underneath uh, the ground there's so much infrastructure, so much fiber, gas, things like that, that we have no room uh, to excavate and run a new main. We've looked at going uh, north to Belde, but then we would be going through the Conservancy and, and the Indian Mounds, which takes that off the table. We looked at going out the back way and along the Aldo Leopold driveway that conflicted with uh, the parks project and the parking lot. Um, so the next route that we're looking at is going immediately south from the top and possibly connecting to the private water main that uh, is for the multi-story apartment complex. Um, we have reached out uh, to have an initial discussion with the managers of the complex and they seem favorable to it. So what we would work on next year is to continue to talk with them and figure out a way that we could run a main through there and then basically take over their fire line and make it a public system um, and upsizing down to Femrite Drive. So. Um, I guess in the water utility, we see that as a, some critical infrastructure, a critical project, uh, providing security to the water system. So um, that would be it for the uh, the water utility as far as the capital budget goes. Any questions for Dan? Okay. I think we can go ahead. Next item would be uh, in the storm. Uh, we have uh, this item and then the next one that Brad will talk about for Reach 64. The annual storm main repair program that, that, uh, that I'll be talking about is for $35,000. It's uh, been in our capital budget every year for the past few years. We use this uh, to make repairs. I don't want to call them emergency repairs, but they have turned out to be emergency repairs because they typically show up in our streets. It's when the corrugated main that um, goes from inlet to inlet uh, usually uh, 
fails and we have depression in the road. And it, it seems that we have about three or four of these a year where we do inlet repair and uh, store main replacement. So we use this money to complete that work. We'd like to keep that program going. Any questions, questions on that one? Okay. Brad, you want to uh, take it over for Reach 64? Yeah, so this is uh, part of phase two of Reach 64's um, sets of projects. We try and complete a major stormwater treatment and improvement project every five years. That's once every um, MS4 burn term, and MS4 is our DNR required permits for stormwater. Um, reach 64 is one of the reaches. It's the only reach currently in the city of Monona that is not meeting the uh, EPA uh, water quality and uh, DNR water quality um, treatment uh, requirements. Um, we participate in Yahara Winds Adaptive Management Program, which helps to reduce those requirements, uh, and it's approved by the DNR. Um, so the city doesn't have to do all of the heavy lifting themselves, um, especially seeing as the city of Monona doesn't produce the majority of uh, phosphorus and, and uh, suspended solids that actually end up reaching our lakes and rivers. So uh, this funding is to perform preliminary engineering for a project that is currently prioritized for uh, the Maywood Park area, um, with the caveat that it, it may possibly need to include a stretch of uh, city right of way that goes um, straight through, or not through, but between uh, properties from McKenna Road to uh, Midmore Road. Um, this includes the possibility of designing um, underground, underground uh, water detention um, uh, or an actual accurate pond that depends on uh, you know, the cooperation between the Parks Department, the City's uh, Public Works Department, what is and is not the best treatment um, in vain for the buck. Uh, this also, this preliminary engineering also preps City to apply for um, WDNR and UNPS um, grants and county urban water quality grants in 2024. Um, so it would be uh, it'd be necessary to get that information so that we can actually put those applications together. Uh, so either way, we would have to either spend this in 2023 or spend it all in 2024 and try and fit it all in one year. And this is kind of the process we used to approach all of our other significant stormwater projects. So there's a set of, you know, there's a year of preliminary engineering, then there's a year of grant applications and Final design, and then we bid the project and, and construct it. So. And what are the grants that we've applied for? How, what percentage are they typically? Do they typically cover of the project. We, it's pretty substantial, uh, the, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Go ahead, Brad. The county's urban water quality grant is a 50-50 up to I think five hundred thousand um, dollars. So if it's a million dollar project, they have the potential to fund five hundred thousand, I believe. Um, uh, it used to be uh, it used to be 640 uh, for some uh, higher priority regions that they've had to reduce it. Uh, the DNR, I believe, it, it's kind of all over the place, but I think it's up to um, 35 percent. I want to say, um, and in historically, because the pool of money is so you know it's limited. And then they fund projects all over the states, not just for Dayton County. Uh, so we've we've been somewhere around twenty five percent for most of our grants, all said and done, for the you know the eligible features for projects. And it's probably important to note that none of these grants fund the actual park improvements portions. This is strictly just for stormwater treatment. One other, one other grant that Brad has always got uh, for stormwater too is the Yara Winds grant. It doesn't cover a lot, but it's it's something that adds to uh, offset the cost. Questions and Teresa. My only question is that I'm 
Not following the ranking numbers on some of the individual pages. I think like each one is from a different budget. Is that different, right? Different revenue source. Different right. revenue okay. source. Yeah. All right. So this is the stormwater budget you're talking about right. now, right? Number one for stormwater. Yeah. And next we're running it and going to the sanitary right. sewer Got budget. It. The water utility storm and sewer um, are revenue bonds and not under the general fund, so we uh, we list them differently on that um, the overall budget sheet where Mark has source of funding. Um, you think the, the utilities basically don't impact the general fund? Right, they're borrowing. Just so. different sources yeah. of money right now. Okay, the last item uh, on the project side of things. Uh, Similar to the stormwater, we have the sanitary sewer repair program, 25,000. Uh, this goes to emergency repairs, uh, whether it be lining a sewer main, uh, or uh, coating a manhole, or replacing a manhole, things like that. We do televising every year, and if, if uh, the video reports show a, a collapsed main, uh, or open soil, which we've we've seen recently, where uh, uh, the top section of the main was gone. Uh, this twenty five thousand will will cover that that emergency repair. Um, it's been in the budget for a number of years now. Uh, at times, the whole budget gets used. At times, half of it gets used, but you know, it's there to make the emergency repairs. And we'd like to keep that program going. Questions. Now we'll move on to equipment, just page 71. <coughs> okay, I did hand out uh, this sheet to you um, before Jake went. Uh, it kind of goes along um, with the public works equipment that I'll be talking about. And I believe it was either last year or the year before the mayor asked for more of a snapshot of equipment coming up. So I know our, our capital budget is a five-year capital budget. I also put together a future list just to give you all an idea of what's coming down the road. Um, a lot of it is big ticket items. Uh, I've listed the age of the equipment on the side. Um, but this is a snapshot of what we're looking at all the way down to 2032 as far as equipment replacement within the department. Um, so what I have in the budget for next year, uh, you'll see the first one is the plow truck with the snow and ice control equipment. It's a tandem axle. Uh, right now, the 2023 truck, we would probably receive it in 2024. Um, Alderwood emailed me today uh, with some questions about this, this truck and I talked to Jeff and he said this might actually be three years out so it's it's the supply chain shortage that we're wow. we're seeing um, we ordered a truck that was in this year's capital budget we're gonna take delivery of that next year we, we typically have delivery by now so so when do we pay <laughs> yeah when we receive it, when we receive it. Um, but the thing with the chassis if the cha when the chassis comes in we pay for the chassis then it goes to the upfitters. Once the upfitters are done with it, then we pay them. So it's a it's a two part process. Yeah. Are we guaranteed this price? Uh, Even though it's two years from now, or that I don't know, and I don't believe. Uh, I'm not sure what Fire experienced when when they placed their orders. Um, I, I believe the the sheet that we have was not. Let me look it up real quick, Mary. I have it in front of me here. I think fire was guaranteed, weren't they? If they put it in by the end of this fiscal. Yeah, yeah wasn't that what Jerry was saying that the re they were locked in to that lower yeah. price? Yeah. But different equipment, to correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, this one does not say how good, how long the quote is good for. I will know by the time this goes to council, though, if okay. it makes it that far. We'll, we'll contact International. Uh, so right now, the, the estimated price, uh, based on today's quote, uh, is around 249000 that we're asking for. Uh, we have with this the equipment rating sheet. 
that Ron prepared. He does that every year for us for equipment I bring forward. It has a points total of 34, and uh, which according to the model that the city approved and is based on the national model of the APWA, I did include all that uh, in the capital budget for you as well, um, mm -hmm. the approved model. So Alderwood did ask if, um, uh, you know, if it's in good working order, why, why is it up for replacement? Um, it, it'll be 18 years old next year, and the life where you typically get rid of these trucks is 18 to 20 years before you have to start sticking more dollars into them. And part of Ron's sheet here indicates that we spent about $29,000 on this particular truck since 2012. And uh, there's some big maintenance items coming up. Um, we could keep it, but we'd have to fulfill that maintenance. The drivetrain Ron is expecting will need to be replaced. Um, other needed work that he's expecting is for sure the transmission and rebuilding the rear axles. The engine will be based on need. Uh, so th this truck would get us a good dollar at auction, um, but you typically want to get rid of these trucks before they become more of a bigger problem. If, Ron, we, if we have to wait three years, are we going to run into issues with the drivetrain and that kind of thing before then? Uh, that would be a, a question for Ron um, based on his knowledge of the actual maintenance he performed. I can ask him. Uh, what his thoughts are on that truck. Um, the, the rear axles I could see uh, needing the rebuild. Uh, the drivetrain possibly. The engine is probably the lower on the, on the list. Um, just based on, on the, the fact that this is a heavy duty truck. It's out there on all the water main brakes and uh, it's, it's uh, the truck that has the majority of our collector routes. Um, so it's it's used for the heavy lifting, but uh, a few years ago we did buy a second tandem axle, so it, it's kind of sharing the load a little bit. Um, so I don't know, Doug, did I kind of answer the questions you had, or was there a few more? Yeah, it just uh, it, you know caught my eye when it says it's in gen good general condition right. for the type of use, and I guess you know the reason it's still in good condition is partly. For Largely because of the mechanics work right. on the vehicle. So. Ma mainly the box. He, the, the dump body, um, I think it was uh, about two years ago, he, he replaced the floor of the dump body. Uh, there was a few other uh, holes from rocks and stuff over the years. Um, she did those up, and then he, he did a complete repaint of, of, the, of the truck dump portion. We were able to do that right in our shop. Um, so that, that's where you've seen some of the, the costs come in since 2012, some of it's recent, but the dump body itself, uh, we, we've done some good repairs to it, which will make it attractive for buyers at auction. Kathy? Just a comment for the newer ones among us. We have an incredible, an incredible mechanic. We do. Who saves us and gets blood out of a turnip. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he, he gets the last possible mile. He is totally, um, I mean, he's on target about what's wrong, how long stuff will last. And, um, you know, we have great staff, and, and he is to be counted among them because he has saved us tens of thousands of dollars in equipment and allowed us to use it to stretch it forever. I don't know if you want to say anything, Dan. But no, I would just add to that, Ron. He he can fabricate. Um, I mean, he, he he has the ability to, to. I mean, like take things apart that look structurally like you shouldn't mess with it. And he has the ability to modify it. Um, we had a lawnmower, an old Toro lawnmower, that was at the end of its life, but we had no way to blow snow on a on a 48 inch sidewalk he he sliced it in half and <laughs> narrowed it and he made it work yeah, he's, um, he just he's incredible right the the black rails you see on nickels by uh, the blue park mm -hmm. and the channel ron fabricated all that um he he can pretty much fix anything so he's he does save us money 
So, so when he tells you something, you can you can count on it being accurate yeah. and and right. correct. So, can he build bike racks, pool deck furniture, and picnic? <laughs> 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 then we wouldn't did, have him working in Palo yeah, right. did, did, Didn't he do a leaf blower for us? When oh, yeah. he, the leaf sucker. He he did. Uh, he, what? It was. He actually, we actually sent his modification to the manufacturer, um, and so the intake it was on our, our latest truck, our, our newest truck. Uh, the intake is probably 18 inches in diameter, and it basically the manufacturer's design had it hitting a wall. Uh, the, the elbow wasn't a sweeping elbow, so it hit, hit, oh, and then yeah. went in, yeah. and it, it was causing the impeller to to get clogged up. Um, it didn't destroy the warranty. We, we, we talked about it with uh, our local rep first, but he basically uh, cut a hole in the truck and rebuilt the, the chute, the, the discharge chute of the intake on the, on the leaf truck. Um, and I believe they incorporated that into their design. Wow. Um, yeah, he's, he's so. really good. <laughs> he, he had the ability to do all that in the shop, and he is a painter as well. So uh, he was able to to paint the, the box again yeah. and match it up. So, yeah. is is he the guy who built the things for the elections, or was that someone else? Oh, uh, that was Dan. Dan's the uh, Dan. Dan and Justin. They have a a, a framing construction okay. construction background. Justin used to build homes, so. Um, we have uh, people who can do pretty much anything. Um, That's all those Mike frames is, that are on the desks oh, when you sure. go to yeah. check in at the, yeah. because of COVID. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mike and Carolyn are our concrete people. Um, we're, we're things that we used to hire out, we, we do in house now. So. Is he the guy that built cool. the water wagon? Um, oh, yeah, I forgot about the water wagon. Well, Ron assisted with that. Actually, yeah, Ron that built the water pretty wagon. Pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that was the old trailer that he fabricated. That I forgot about the wagon. Yeah. With the old street signs. Yeah, that was Ron that built that. They painted it, and it mm -hmm. was great. Yeah. Yep. So, anyway. So, that's Mark had a question on this. So if we're not going to get get it for two years, we don't pay for it until we get it. Right. Mm -hmm. Why do we? We wouldn't borrow for it, right? Or what? Well, yeah, I think that'd be one of the things you kind of have to look at, see the timing of it. Yeah. Just like with the ambulance, we had to order the chassis by a certain date. I don't yeah. know, last right. winter, spring or something, but we have to pay for it by the end it's of this just, year, yeah. even though we won't get it for two You're years. getting in the queue is what you're doing. So we yeah. should so. we should make sure that that... Yeah. Yeah. But if we can lock in the lower price, that's great. That's the... the yeah. That's well, I guess it's good to find out the time, and I was wanting yeah. to order it. If you I, yeah. Cause it will probably we'll reach out to the, International tomorrow and just get their comments on, on how long that quote is good for or you know if if the chassis is a year and a half two years out I don't know if they're guaranteeing the, the prices mm, that they give right. you today because yeah. their prices is going to go up yeah so more than likely without knowing what they're going to say tomorrow um, if you approve going forward with the truck this year the price will probably come back with an updated price next year, and we'll, if it's delivered in 25, at least for the upfit, we'll probably come back in 25 for another update on the price. That that's with these bigger vehicles, I I don't know how else we would do it yeah. uh, with a three-year delay. Well, I guess so. if you could try to find out by Monday would be great, or otherwise certainly the second meeting in October. No, I'll I'll ask Jeff to give him a call tomorrow. Okay. So. All right. Um, any other questions about this one? Move on to the the one ton dump truck, which I think we moved to next year from this year. last year's yeah. budget. We yeah. Made. yeah. So th this appeared last year, um, which uh, the mayor did bump to this year. So we're back this year, and uh, it's um, a 2003 Chevy one ton one ton dump truck. Uh, this is the one that we put the anti-icing equipment on uh, every winter. Uh, so when you see the white lines on the road, this is the truck that does it. Um, we also put the uh, the chipping box uh, on here in summertime. So that's pretty much the use for this truck in winter, anti-icing, and in summer it's uh, it's running with the chipper. Um, the second page of this uh, has Ron's 
point system again. Uh, we're at a 36. The truck will be 20 years, uh, 20 years old next year, which is quite a long time for a, a truck like this to, to be kept in operation. Um, he has it listed as a severe duty uh, with towing and hauling. And uh, he's, uh, because we, are, we do work with uh, anti-icing and salt application, we do have electrical issues with it, and he um, he takes care of those every year. Uh, we have accelerated corrosion because of, of the uh, the salt brine, um, but we're looking to replace this uh, this next year. And I believe this is also another truck that we would expect delivery in 24, um, based on on the fact that we have the truck out there right now. That's a, a smaller version of this. Um, that we're not we're not going to get delivery this year for it. So, questions? This okay. Moving on uh, to the last piece. Uh, this was also one that the mayor did uh, bump to this year. It's uh, the Gravely Stand Up Mower. Um, we use this to mow the medians on Broadway and on Monona Drive. It's one of our three mowers that we use. Um, we spent about 3900 uh, on maintenance in the last eight years. And uh, th this, believe it or not, this this is a workhorse and um, it's done a lot of work for us. It uh, definitely was a good purchase. We, this is our first one that we've had for a stand-up mower. Uh, we want to buy the same one again, uh, just the, the new model for it. Um, the updated price would be about $8,500. Any questions? Brian? I have a question that really doesn't relate exactly to this budget. It has more to do with the point allocation system, which I think has been extremely beneficial for the public works um, equipment. Um, and I'm curious of why we don't use that same system for other fleet vehicles across the city. We do, don't we? Well, if we go back and look at the But I don't think we always get EMS. the sheets. Yeah. I think. Well, police, fire, and EMS, none of them reported anything in the similar type of categorization. Yeah. It's, it's been offered out there. Um, parks, don't we? I thought we did. Uh, Ron, Ron does maintain the parks pickups. Um, he maintains some things on the squads. He did last year for um, parks. I know he had one for parks. If they request Ron to do it, uh, he can do it. But it, it's a it's a city council adopted model so it can be i don't know if it would work quite well on the fire trucks because ron doesn't have expertise in that he does some work on the fire trucks but i think they go to uh they go up to uh, pierce. pierce for all yeah. that or but at least for for example the brush truck that's being recommended mm -hmm. um it's half ton truck well, right and, and that's being replaced more because it doesn't work with the like it won't fit under the underground parking garages right. where it needs to go. Yeah. Well, the Back, current one does. The current one doesn't. He said. Jerry said that's why he wants to. Replace, that's one of the reasons he wants to replace it. That's, what he's, that's what, he's what he's told us anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, he just said it went on five calls for underground, yeah. twenty some brush fires and five underground. Well, I don't know. It's Maybe some it's some that it doesn't fit under. I don't know. But that's what he told us as his rationale. Yeah, yeah. then the weight of it. The weight. I think it's not designed to carry. Was that in the underground in the way? Is what he's yeah. I'm not sure if Chief Brian knows about this. I, I think Wally used it. Yeah, uh, when he Wally was here. Used it. So we can tell um, Brian to take a look at it. Yeah. So I, I think, just think we've it's kind of always been on this model of two squads every year, haven't we? Since yeah. I've been around it, no, I, yeah. I don't know where that was. I think just to kind of space them out. And I think the their replacement um, interval does pretty much meet the APWA points model because of the, the use that those vehicles mm -hmm. get. So, um, and I know with the f at least some of the fire truck and EMS, they have to be, re there's some, I always think it's kind of interesting, like there's some code that firemen follow as to how often some of that equipment has to be sure. replaced. And yeah. so well, I think. Um, because it affects insurance yeah, premiums right. or businesses because of the the age, the pumping capacity, yeah. et cetera. So it's not, some of them could be in pretty good shape, right. but 
they have their industry standard for their vehicles, but I think um, like the Suburban they have, mm -hmm. um, you know, the anything uh, a 350 or 3500 or smaller, we could Ryan could do for sure, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the point system. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ron Hoffman. Yep. Oh, I did have one more question. Yep. Um, yeah, in this sheet here that you handed out, it shows that in the 2025 equipment, you have the 2016 rider mower expected delivery 2023. Is that just like maybe a line carry down, drop down air or something? Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Oh, you're, you're not expecting yeah. delivery on no that, that no okay no i didn't yeah, know if that's... it was like oh we want to move it up or it actually got moved somewhere. yeah that, that's my bad that okay. that's no worries one to just want to make sure yep actually the ventrack is something that we would probably get in the same year being a small a small war okay I, oh i'm sorry. sorry i only did this for this year and next year, because I don't know how long the the shortage is going to last. So. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Have anything for Dan about any of his budget items? And uh, Mayor, I will have some of these answers definitely uh, within the next week. Great. Um, so you have more going into the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. I think that. Takes us to the end of uh, is that presentations. Just one for building. Uh, oh, I forgot about the buildings. I'm just sorry. a couple. This, just H20. building improvements. Yeah, forty thousand. Basically, uh, we've been borrow. We've been budgeting uh, about forty thousand every year um, for the last 10, 15 years. It's for unexpected um, building expenses. Like this year, we had or more last year, like boilers that broke that we had to pay. Um, Roof issues. So, if we have for larger type activities, we've been using this to, to cover those charges. Um, and the other one is the public safety building design. Um, we have we budgeted we borrowed four hundred thousand in two thousand twenty-two, and this is what we'll have left to carry over into two thousand twenty-three. So, I'm just kind of showing basically it's a carry over, and this we use um, depends where what we have is the referendum and things. Like that. That this is just kind of a placeholder uh, for that for now. If we need more, we'll eventually the public safety building. We'll be probably taking a different type of loan out there, so we can wrap it into that um, future loan. Question. Hey, Marky, are you still? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to say one quick thing. Sorry. Um, just so that everybody knows, some a lot of new members on the council. This is forty thousand for the city hall building improvements. We have the same amount um, in twenty twenty two budgeted. We also have uh, operating side maintenance, which is more for uh, general maintenance items, th things that just have to break that aren't necessarily big capital items, you know, permanent fixtures, so to speak. Um, this budget was gone completely spent and over spent before the end of. Um, September. So uh, it's a it's one of those items that historically, have, if you look back through the capital budgets of the past, um, has been a chopping block item. Um, I would highly recommend that the city council does not lower this budget amount at all for 2023. Um, it could be it could turn out to be a, a bad year like this year. Thank you. Any questions about the buildings? So. Um, any questions about, thank you, Brad. Any questions about anything else? Um, you want to talk about amendments? Yeah, or? the process from here. That was a quick turnaround. The next meeting is uh, first reading will be on uh, Monday. And the approval will be on the third Monday. I don't know what the exact date that is, but the third Monday of October. Um, so the way the process is, is if you want a budget amendment, um, if you get it to me and I can put it in the packet and type it up for you, just tell me what the description is or 
how much you're just spending. But if you, the packet goes out tomorrow, so I know it's a quick turnaround if you want it in the packet. Um, if you think of something over the weekend, let me know and I can bring hand it out that first reading um, on Monday. But you don't have to have the amendment for Monday to be approved on the final. So we don't vote on them until the 17th. Yeah, so it's more for anyway. discussion purposes. So if you find somewhere else, you're reviewing it a week later, you know, this is what I want for a budget amendment. That's fine too. We just have to have everything before that third uh, Monday in uh, October. And typically you have a co sponsor for those, right? Um, you is can. That, yeah. It doesn't need to be. You just need a second to raise it um, when the meeting comes. Yeah. And does that make sense? I hope so. That's where we've been doing it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, just, I meant more for the new members <laughs> than anyone else. Um, just something else. Regarding um, the operating budget, Mark and I just sat down today and figured out dates for that. Um, we're going to, we've scheduled a uh, committee of the whole for operating, which for Patrick and Teresa works quite a bit like this does, except it's a lot more detailed, yeah. longer. It'll be two nights, um, October 27th and the 31st. We have a fifth Monday. Yeah. So you won't be able to go trick-or-treating, um, but we're going to try to make sure that staff who have little kids are not presenting on the 31st. Um, so if you want to get that on your calendar, it'll probably be 5.30. Also the, start, I imagine. Yeah, also the calendar you know, tomorrow. So. so it was October 27th, which is a Thursday, I think, yeah. and the 31st, which is a Monday. Mm -hmm. Did you want to go to Halloween? No, it's the kind of road just but when it comes to trick or treaters, or something like, sorry, they're all ready to get them all. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> any other questions? Okay. Well, we got done. We're like uh, half hour early, which is good. So, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you. Okay. Oh, was that the night? Yeah. Thank you very much. So, Mary, I <coughs> sort of um, it came up at public safety. The city of Madison yeah, is adopted.